Hello YouTube and Odyssey. Hello everybody. Welcome to day 43, part 47 of our Jodie Arias, the Wicked Witch of the Weird series. Yeah, welcome back everyone. Uh, today is going to be really interesting. It's another, we think it's another full day of Juan Martinez cross-examining Alice Lavila. I can't wait. Now there have already been numerous holes picked in. Alice's testimony I expect gaping holes to be <laughs> I expect him to drive through some of these like trucks oh, of course he will today yeah so today is going to be really interesting um thanks to everyone who mar watched the marshmallow manifesto uh we did a three-hour video where we basically read out 36 pages of the most insanely idiotic bollocks <laughs> yeah it was horrible wasn't it it was it was cringe worthy yeah we, we think we've just about recovered from that we've we've had a spot of something haven't we a bit of a summer <laughs> cold but it's not stopped us working on this this is quite a long one um we we anticipate so um be in for a long long haul on this one yeah it's uh like nearly four hours uh, probably yeah it's gonna be because i mean we've not recorded it yet have we but um the source video was well over four hours so um <laughs> we're with, anticipating with sidebars and you know so we take the sidebars out with sidebars and our commentary it's probably going to be well over four hours this so buckle yourselves in guys um just our disclaimers now we are watching this for the very first time we've never seen any of these days of, of testimony before so what you're getting is our first time commentary and you know what we think the first time we see it um so if you do want to watch the original we're going to leave the links to the original day of testimony and the footage we used in the description and also just to let you know that um what we say is just our opinion even our opinion of alice laviola we don't expect you to agree with us we don't expect you to share that opinion this is just us saying what we think of this day of testimony and every day of testimony um just our opinion also, we are not professionals. We don't say we are. We have no expert training. We're just two ordinary people who just say what we see. Yeah, and as we said before, we don't have any domestic violence expertise either. But we can smell BS when we hear it, can't we? Absolutely. And we can tell when somebody clearly has an agenda and has a clear bias, which Alice has, doesn't she? Oh, absolutely. Um, so, okay, as we always say... Um, grab yourself something to eat, drink, smoke, imbibe, whatever. <laughs> uh, sit back, relax, um, fall asleep if you want to, to this, but um, watch Ma Juan Martinez, we hope, take Alice LaViolet down a little bit further. Yeah. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez, you may continue with cross-examination. Ma'am, your assessment in this case and your opinion in this case was based in large part on an interview that you had with the defendant, correct? Incorrect. So you did not base your assessment on a 44-hour interview that you had with the defendant? I based it on the materials that I, I told you that I've read. So in terms of your assessment, nothing of what the defendant told you was important to you? I didn't say that. I said that I didn't base my, my opinion entirely on my 44-hour interview. My question was, isn't it true that your opinion in this case was based, based in large part on an interview with the defendant? No objection. Ask me answer. In part. Oh, so it, it's a 50-50 kind of split? And from this, I think we can tell exactly how this day is going to go. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, and, and I'm sure there's going to be more objections. Yeah, he's already making the start to chuckle, isn't he? <laughs> he always does. It's just yeah. the way he starts off and the things he comes out with. Yeah. He, he does, you know, 
semantics with him is an absolute pleasure, I tell you. It really is. I've just never really thought about the split, Miss Laurentina, so I just take everything that I get. So you don't know? Sustained. Did you finish your response? When I take a case, I explore every aspect of that case Jason that Rollins. I can. Next question. So, in this case, though, you did talk to the defendant, correct? Yes, I did. And you made a determination in your mind that she was being truthful, correct? I made an, an, an assessment that it was worth pursuing. Ma'am, do you remember that you and I had a conversation? And during that conversation that you told me, you found the defendant to be truthful. I found the defendant to be credible, and I would move on with my investigation. Which means you found her to be truthful, right? All right. No, not all right. Isn't that what you found? I found her to be credible. Yes, and I cre did. And credible means the same thing as being truthful, right? I found her to be believable. Have you noticed how she's been deliberately obstructive? She isn't even... You know, giving him any leeway with the choice of words he's using. Exactly. And she's dancing around us what she actually means when really she believed her to be truthful. Yeah. Fell for it, hook, line and sinker. Exactly. Yes. And believable means truthful, right? I wasn't... You're asking me for a yes or no, Mr. Martinez, and what I would say to you is... I found her to be believable enough so that I would continue with the case. So you believed her, is what you're saying? I believed enough to be able to continue with the case. And when you say that you believed enough, it seems to leave open the fact that perhaps you didn't believe some of the things that she was saying. It said that I was willing to pursue the case. I'm not asking you about whether or not you were willing to pursue the case. Do you remember that when we, asked, when we started this exchange, you and I, I asked you about your assessment? Do you remember that in your opinion? Yes, I do. I'm asking you about the assessment and the opinion. Based, your assessment and opinion is based in part, as you said, on your conversation with the defendant, right? Correct. And you found her during that conversa those conversations to be believable, right? I found her to be believable in terms of what I talked to her about at that time. So the answer is yes, you found her believable during those 44 hours, correct? I found her to be believable. Are, you're asking me about my first or my entire 44 hours? My question indicated 44 hours, ma'am. Do you understand that? Just answer the question, you slapped up old Halibut. It's a simple yes or no. I do understand that, Mr. Martinez. All right, then. In those 44 hours, did you find her to be believable? Yes, I did. And that's part of the reason why you came in and gave us the opinion that you gave us in this case, right? In part. That's right. And are you familiar with the concept of secondary gain? Yes, I am. And the concept of secondary gain is that in situations such as this, if it's to the person's benefit, they may be deceitful, correct? They may be deceitful. And in this case, you found no issue with regard to the secondary gain involving this defendant, right? I met Ms. Arias. Judge, after. she's non responsive. It's a yes or no. Sustained. Can you answer yes or no, please? It's not really a yes or no question. Then we will move on. Okay. Ma'am, with regard to this particular case, the thought of secondary gain, did that even enter your mind? Sure. And did you assess it? There's not a real way to assess secondary gain other than by looking at collateral data, which I looked at. I'm not asking you what you looked at. I'm asking you whether or not you assessed it, yes or no. You assess it by looking at collateral Judge is just data. Not responding to me. Judge, she's attempting to respond. It's not a yes or no answer. Overruled. Ma'am, I'm asking you yes or no. Oh, I'm sorry. We're done. Jenny, with all due respect, Sit down and shut up. Yeah, this has been dragging on and on and on. Yes or no, did you consider the issue of secondary gain in this case? I said that I did. And with regard to this issue of secondary gain, you, after whatever assessment that you made or whatever you considered, 
you decided that the issue, uh, there was no secondary gain issue in this case, right? I did not make an assessment of whether there was secondary gain in terms of looking, once I had looked at all the other information, there's always something that you put in the back of your head, Mr. Martinez, about what somebody's secondary gain might be. You consider that in everything, and so you take that picture and you investigate that picture and you pull in your collateral sources to do that, Mr. Martinez, and that's what I did. So I you're pulled in all the sources that I could possibly pull in to be able to assess. I think Alice may have intended to do all of that, pull in all these collateral sources, but I think she was so bowled over by Jody's personality, felt sorry for her, whatever. All her professionalism and all her objectivity went straight out of the window and she fell under the spell. There's no other explanation for it, really, is there? Yeah, and the fact is... She knows she's lying. Yeah. And that is why it's fine. She's being this evasive when she's trying, when Martinez is asking her questions. Dr. Kevin Horn, the, the um, witnesses from, you know, Maricopa County PD, as well as, you know, the, the Flores who kept testifying. Yeah. All of those people, plus Martinez picking holes in Samuel's testimony and analysis testimony. All of this supports that Jody is lying, yet her blinkers are still firmly on. Of course they are. I mean, she's a Jody fan. Yeah, but it's not just that she's a Jody fan. I think a lot of it is she's worried about her professional reputation if she admit, admits that she was wrong about Jody. So maybe that is one of the reasons why she is sticking, you know, stuck in mud in this stance defending her no matter what. And probably that's maybe the reason why she still does to this day. Who knows? Yeah, who? I mean, we don't know what she thought after the trial. Well, we do know that, you know, it, her reputation suffered a severe setback um, and it did affect her. She got death threats and all that, which obviously we'd never wish on her. You know, we wouldn't but no, wish, you anything, wish that on anyone. You know, but... personal harm on her or anything like that. We just think that as an expert in this case... She just behaved atrociously, and we will call her out for it, you know. The professionalism, as you said, went out the window. Yeah. So she deserves to be derided for her testimony in this case, and she deserves every second of it. Yeah, because she shouldn't even be up there. Yeah. So your conclusion is, based on whatever it is that you did in your mind, ma'am, your conclusion is there was... That, that there was no secondary gain here, right? I never said no secondary gain or secondary gain. I, I, I looked at all of the material and believed Miss Arias confessed to the crime. Judge, she's not being responsive to the question that she just asked. Ask another question. With regard to this issue of secondary gain, ma'am, whether you looked at material, whether you didn't look at material, whether you did 44 hours or whether you did 38 and a half, however you looked at it, when whatever you considered, isn't it true that you really didn't reach a decision with regard to secondary gain in this case? I considered it in my decision, Mr. Martinez. So you did consider the issue of secondary gain and decided that there was no problem with that particular issue in this case? I decided that there was domestic violence. Judge, she's just not being responsive here. Sustained. You may approach. You may approach. Yes or no? Did you rule out secondary gain with regard to the defendant? I did not rule out secondary gain. So that means that in your assessment, there's still an impossibility then that the defendant, whatever reason she may have had, may have been less than truthful with you, correct? 
it was open to my other assessments that I was I have a limited scope uh, here, Mr. Martinez. Sustained. I'm sustained. Next question. My question is this, since you did not rule out the def this issue of secondary gain, isn't it true, ma'am, that because your assessment was lacking in that aspect, that she, the defendant, could have been less than truthful with you in those 44 hours that you spoke with her? I didn't rule out secondary gain. I looked at it in the context of all the other information. I was limited to looking at domestic violence and I was to assess whether I believe there was domestic violence. And Mr. Martinez, I assessed that there was. That's my, that was what I was supposed to do. I would dearly love to know how many times Alice testified in a trial prior to this. I'm sure she's done it in many criminal trials. Yeah, so how did she go on in them? Yeah, and is she being as obfuscating as she is in this one? And evasive. Yes, because she is not, she is dancing around the questions again, and she is not, it's taking Martinez to appeal to the judge to get her to answer the question, and even then, she doesn't answer the question. No, she goes back on herself. She's not as frustrating as Jody was when she was on the stand because she nearly drove me and you nuts out, didn't Oh, she? God, yeah. But she's getting there, isn't she? Oh, absolutely. She, she, she is. She is becoming pretty bloody insufferable. Sustain, next question. We know what you were there to do, but in assessing domestic violence, you by necessity have to take into account what the defendant is saying, whether or not she's being truthful, correct? Correct. And that involves the issue of secondary gain, doesn't it? It certainly does. And in this case, you just told us that you did not rule it out, which, which means that you did not, in this case, complete an assessment that was free, if you will, of this issue of the defendant being truthful. There's not an assessment that rules out secondary gain, Mr. Martinez. Well, when you sit and you talk to somebody, one of the things that we talked about yesterday was whether or not you were the human lie detector. One of the things that you do have to do is make an assessment as part of your investigation as to whether or not an individual is telling you the truth or not, correct? There is always reasonable doubt, Mr. Martinez. That's what Objection this whole... Not responsive. No, that's, it is responsive. Let me finish your question, or finish your answer, excuse me. Reasonable doubt is part of what you go into this with, I hope. Reasonable doubt is part of what any expert witness would go into a situation with. Reasonable doubt is what the jury goes in with. Wrong. Very, very wrong. The jury goes in, innocent until proven guilty. Exactly, and that's how most people do see it. Reasonable doubt has to be established. So she is dead wrong there, especially oh, about the jury. Yeah, I think the jurors can answer that themselves. Yeah. It's what, it's what you go in with, and then you build your foundation, and you look to see whether or not you have the foundation for this. I believed I have the foundation for this, or I would never have proceeded. With regard to this issue of reasonable doubt, that's the standard that you applied then. Is that what you're saying? I, I always... Yes or no? Sure. And in this case, when you were assessing the defendant's statement, even though you did not rule out secondary gain, you applied this other standard of reasonable doubt, right? I apply... Yes or no? It's, no, it's a semantics thing, and, I'm, and I don't know where you go with this. Do you have an objection? Non-responsive. Sustained. Next question. So, ma'am, you did use the word beyond a reasonable doubt, didn't you? Very quick point, Annika and a few other people in our chats when we've been, been doing premieres have been very, very annoyed at um, Alice's use of, well, she keeps saying Mr. Martinez all the time. Right? Yeah. We hear you, but think how many times he calls her ma'am. Yeah. Because yeah. that is also pointed, it's also barbed. 
He did the same thing with Jody, and every time he says it, he's doing it with contempt. Of course he is. You can see it and you can hear it. Exactly. So every time you hear her say, Mr. Martinez, for every one time she is saying that, he's giving her about four or five meams. <laughs> I did. I used the word reasonable doubt. Yes, you did with regard to this issue of what you, in your assessment of the defendant's statements to you, right? I have skepticism when I go in and I look at that. I have doubt. Of course I have doubt. I'm not asking you whether or not you had doubt. I'm asking you with regard to this case and the defendant's statement why it was that you did not rule out this issue about whether or not she could have been less than truthful with you. I didn't say I didn't look at that. So you did rule it out then? I didn't entirely rule out anything. So are you saying you did believe her or not? Which of the two? I believed her. Yeah, and look at Jody there. She's thinking, sucker. But she's all <laughs> I've got between, you know, me and potentially death. Yeah, that's all she has. Yeah. But it's their own fault, really. Yeah, completely. And I continue, as I do with my other cases, to keep an open mind about what may come up. So when I do a case, I can pull out of that case at any time. If I I'm don't not asking believe... you if you can pull out of a case. I am asking you whether or not you believed her in this evaluation. That's all I'm asking you. Yes, I believe her. And one of the things that you did in this particular evaluation is only talk to her, correct? In, in what part of the evaluation? Any part of the evaluation. Isn't it true that you did not talk to any, you didn't talk to Mr. Alexander, did you? No, I did not. You didn't talk to any of the other witnesses, right? No, I did not. Yes, this is exactly where I want him to go. Exactly. Her, her lack of research, her lack of an informed picture. This well, is exactly what I wanted him to address. <laughs> well, it's what we, we've always said. She hasn't talked to anyone else. No. She hasn't talked to his, his friends, his family. Not a living All she's soul. got is Jodie's word. Her eggs are all in one basket. And I tell you what, they're not bloody eggs. They're fucking rat droppings. <laughs> That's true. The only person that you talked to was the defendant, right? Correct. And so in basing your opinion, you based it on large part or small part, on the word of one person that was involved in the relationship, right? Objection is characterized as previous testimony. With what, what she relied on. What role do you mean, answer? I based it on all of the information that I read, not just on this. I read, I'm talking I read about for witnesses. hours and hours and hours more than just looking at Miss Arias. I understand that you want to tell us that you reviewed, you sat in your office and you read. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the mouth moving and you talking to somebody else and their mouth moving. Do we understand that that's what I'm asking? Now, you've just giggled at that, haven't you? But it is sad that um, Martinez has to instruct somebody who is obviously educated and learned how to actually answer a question and how to understand a question that he is asking. She cannot be doing all of this on purpose. She must be, you know, suffering several blanks. Yeah, and the fact that she hasn't got a bleeding... Well, she's acting like she doesn't have a clue what Martinez is asking her. But she perfectly knows. I honestly don't think, despite, you know, I think she may have witnessed Samuels, I don't know, but I don't think she was prepared for him. And I don't think she knows what's going to hit her pretty soon. Because the thing is, no one, no witness is prepared for Martinez. No, no, not when he's got his back up. And he treats, you know, his own witnesses as, as you know, yeah. as harshly as he does, you know, the opposing witnesses. So, of course he does. Right, let's see what he's got to say next. I understand. And with regard to that particular issue, there was only one person that you talked to, and that was the defendant, right? Correct. You didn't speak to Mr. Alexander, right? The objection has to be answered. Sustained. And in your assessment of these things, there are always two sides to every issue, aren't there? In domestic violence. In anything. In domestic violence, the saying goes that 
as opposed to the truth being somewhere in the middle, that the truth is worse than either story because both people are minimizing and denying the story. And you didn't, so, you didn't speak to Mr. Alexander or anybody else about whether or not she was minimizing or changing the story or anything, right? Or whether he was. Exactly, whether anybody was, correct? I read his words, as many I, as I had. Ma'am, I'm talking about talking to people. Of did, course, did, I, I did not talk to other people, Mr. Martinez. I and did not. one of the things that you told us with regard to these type of valuations is that 90% of all communication is nonverbal, right? Sure, you can take that any way you want. Yes or no, that's how I want to take it. It's not yes or no. Nothing is yes or no with her, is it? Nothing. And why the hell is she smiling? Yeah. I mean, she could have told much more if she'd have spoken to somebody maybe on Travis's side of the family, his brothers and sisters, his friends, of which he had many, Mimi, um, Lisa, Diana. She could have even spoken to his church. If she could have sat down for even half an hour with one of the, at least one of them, then her presence on that stand, you know, to give some balance, yeah, might have been warranted, but she didn't. No, she didn't. She spoke Not one to bit. one person, chose to believe that one person above everything, chose to condemn a man that she knew nothing about, but only through Jody's eyes. Exactly, only through hearsay. And she has said the most reprehensible and disgusting things about that man. And as far as I'm concerned, her heart is as black as her client's. Exactly, and he's not here to defend himself. No. And you know something? I think they love that fact, both of them. You didn't testify to that previously in this court? I made a statement. Yes or no? Did you testify to that? In a verbal conversation, much like you and I are having, I bet people here can read in what's going on non-verbally between the two of us. And that's what I was talking about. I'm not interested in what you may be feeling with regard to the prosecutor. I'm asking whether or not you made the statement that in a clinical interview, 90% of the communication is nonverbal. Did you make that statement? Yes. And with regard to this interview that you had with the defendant, one of the people that was involved in it was missing because he's been killed, right? Yes. And so if we apply the mathematics to it, 45, you have a 45% chance of being wrong just right off the bat because you don't have the other person there, right? Objection, no. Right? No. One of the other things that you told us yesterday was that for you, the defendant told the truth as you knew it throughout her life, but yet when this killing happened, that's when she had problems with the truth, right? That's what you told me yesterday, right? Yes. Which means that you, by chance, or by design, investigated her truthfulness before this incident, right? Yes. Did you speak to her father about her truthfulness growing up? No, I did not. Don't you agree that, what is his name? Bill. Don't you agree that Bill Arias would know about whether or not the defendant had been truthful growing up? He would have a view of her truthfulness for sure. Right, just like anything you tell us now is a view of her truthfulness, isn't it? Correct. And don't you think that his view of her truthfulness has a much better basis than yours? He has a much longer history with her and he has a, a questionable history with her. Whether or not he has a questionable history with her, she grew up in his house, didn't she? She did. He saw her on a day-to-day -day basis, right? He did. You didn't, did you? No, I did not. He dealt with her when she went to school, right? Correct. And he dealt with her whenever she had any issues. You did not, right? Correct. And he would know better than you whether or not the defendant had a reputation for honesty Objection. growing up. Pardon? Speculation. 
A world, the answer. Right? Oh, yeah. And so, did you review his conversation with the detective in which he talked about the defendant's truthfulness after the age of 14? Objection, You may. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to go back to the jury room for approximately 10 minutes. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Please be seated. Court is still in pro process. Mr. Martinez, you may examine the witness. And Judge, can I inquire though as to how much of a clip this is? Is this the entire interview or are we just going to hear part of it? Nine seconds. I, I, would, ask for, I would ask for more information so that Ms. Leviolet can put it in context. All right, Mr. Martinez. She, she want, you want more information? Do I need to address the issue of more information? Yes, please. With, this witness. with regard to this uh, particular case, ma'am, the truthfulness of the defendant is important to you, right? Correct. And in fact, you've spent 44 hours with her, correct? Correct. And in part, whether it's a small or a large part, in part, your opinion is based on what the defendant told you, correct? Correct. And then you went out and you corroborated what the defendant told you in an effort to see whether or not she was being truthful, correct? Yeah, and some prior to, right. to meeting with her as and, well. And and in fact, yesterday when we talked about it, you told us yesterday that yes, you believe the defendant was untruthful, but it was, but her untruthfulness was after the murder. Do you remember telling me that yesterday? Her, her pattern of untruthfulness. Right, yes. was after the murder, correct? Yes. And that I asked you specifically about before the murder, and you said you didn't see any uh, indications that she was untruthful, correct? With her prior boyfriends. With anything. Remember, you told us that we talked about whether I, or not I didn't have I didn't have any evidence. I didn't see anything that she was untruthful. Correct. Correct. But you are aware that there was an interview between her and uh, between her father and the detective, uh, Steve Flores. Correct. I I didn't have that information. Jesus, it doesn't matter whether she's got that information or not. It stands to reason that you talk to the people around your client. Exactly, because they can give you a better picture of her. I, I can't understand this. Is this how it is done with domestic violence experts? Do they just talk to one person in a case like this? No, I think most, we, most experts talk to a lot of people, friends, family, relatives. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether Janine DeMart, who's going to be coming up pretty soon on the stand, I'm wondering whether she actually got a more round picture of this whether she got whether she talked to people around jody as well as people around travis i'm guessing that she did because from what people have said she was pretty thorough oh well then she's definitely spoken to people around travis yeah as well but the way that um alice has approached this case is nothing short of disgraceful because there are always two sides to every story and you have to get a complete picture of everything and she has failed on both of those counts. Of course she has. She is an absolute disgrace to her profession and I wouldn't trust her as far as I could throw her in a, in a domestic violence case. I really wouldn't. So you didn't have that information. But if there is information out there from her father that indicated that the defendant was... Yeah, may we approach? You may. Let me mark this as an exhibit, man. It's exhibit 604. Never, she's never been honest with us since then. And she was uh, probably 14 then. Did you hear that? No, I didn't. All right, let's play it again. Never, she's never been honest with us since then, and she was uh, probably 14 then. Did you hear him say, she hasn't been honest with us since then, and she was 14? Did you hear that? Yes, I did. With regard to this particular case, this is not something that you knew when you testified yesterday, correct? No, it is not something I knew. Pardon? No, it is not something I knew. Isn't this something that you would have wanted to consider in deciding whether or not the defendant was being 
uh, whether or not you were going to believe the defendant uh, in this particular case. Objection, Judge. It would be inappropriate to ask the witness this without context to the entire interview. Uh -oh. This is outside the presence of the jury. You may answer the question. Well, I would not take a sound bite of anything and, and make a decision on it. So I'd want to hear the whole, I'd want to hear the whole tape. And I'd also want to put in perspective the things I'd heard about Mr. Arias. And I'd want to put into perspective what I know about teenagers. I think they anticipated that question. And I think that Wilmot got up and did that objection to clear the way for Alice to repeat exactly more or less word for word what Wilmot said in her objection. Exactly. Yeah, that was just... Yeah, I think Martinez walks into that one. That looked rehearsed to me. <laughs> but then again, she says she'd look, she'd also see what teenagers were like. Yeah. Well, didn't he, her father say ten as well? Yeah. That's not a teenager. No, no. But she should have considered at least talking to her parents, which she didn't do. Yeah, she should have by so, rights. You know, a she shouldn't be there anyway because there was no domestic violence, and b. <laughs> She's just a sham because she's just shoddy in her in her work. And her reputation is going to go down. It's in the bog. It's in the bog at the moment, and it's going around the pissing you bend. But my question to you is, this, the fact that this person, her father, is saying that she hasn't been honest since the age of 14. Objection is characterized by what you said. Distinct. Well, let's hear it again, okay? And then I'll ask you a question. Um, never, she's never been honest with us since then. And she was uh, probably 14 then. Did you hear what he said? Yes, I did. She said she's never been honest with us since then, right? Right. And he also said she was 14, correct? Correct. Isn't that Im go contrary? Doesn't that fly in the face of what you just testified to yesterday? that she was always honest before the killing. She was honest? All that time, she, she was honest, like, up until the murder? Who the bloody hell was she? Does Alice think that she was Marie of Trapp or some shit? Either that or a proper full nun. I do not get that. Nobody is completely honest. <laughs> Especially when you're going through the years 14 to 28, which is how old she was when she murdered him. Yeah, and don't forget there's all hormones yeah. going on. You, you, you're going to lie. It is impossible to be. Were, were you ever dishonest from the age of 14 till, say, the age of 18? Of course. Yeah, so was I. Ev I, know, I think, everyone is. I think all of you listening were also dishonest between the ages of 14 and 28. So she's she's painting out. I think she. I think if it was up to Alice, she'd bloody beatify Jody, wouldn't she? I'm sorry, but to use a British colloquialism, what we are dealing with here is not a credible domestic violence expert. We're dealing with a complete wanker. It doesn't fly in the face until I've assessed it. I need to find out. I. The information I had, I didn't have information that she had lied. When you get information from a parent that a child lies to them in, during teenage years, that does not necessarily characterize someone as a liar or not. And so I would want to take that into account with the information I had that was regarding Mr. Arias as well and his rationale for, for perhaps for the reason that she did lie to him. What you're saying is that you would consider it and then you would explain this statement. I would consider it and then I would decide what I was going to do with it once it was considered. Right. And it would be part of the file then, right? That's something you would consider then, right? Yes, it would. I don't have anything else. So, Matt, did you have any questions on this issue? Not until she is able to have a better context of what this is actually about. I'd, I'd be able to either see the, see the entire interview. All right, Council Park. Yeah, one seems pretty determined to get to the bottom of this and to prove that Jody's been a compulsive liar, you know, since her teenage years. 
Yeah, and she hasn't done any better in the adult years either. No, I mean, this, you know, this whole defence <laughs> is completely fabricated and it's the most ridiculous defence ever, you know, a self-defence case for the crime that she perpetrated. It's, of course it is. It's just nonsensical, but... You know, I think he is trying to prove a point. As, and as we've said countless times before, he is like a dog with a bone, a little Yorkshire Terry with a bone, and he will not let go, will he? No, once he's got his teeth in, that yeah, is it. That is it. And he will, you know, prove that point and he will hammer it home. Of course he will. And, 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 and he'll do it in so many different ways. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know... It's a pleasure, really, to watch him work. I mean, all all the crap that we've had to listen to Alice spout, all this one-sided, uninformed, completely, you know, skewed... Crap. ...bull that she has spewed out. We've had to listen to that, and now we're getting it picked apart. And you know something? It's just glorious. I'm just waiting to see what happens when the jury comes back in, and then uh, hopefully we'll get some real savagery yeah i can't wait for that not that he hasn't savaged her already because he has but let's face it well let's him sa- savage her a little bit more yeah and let's get the popcorn yeah mr martinez are you ready oh yes i am Thank all right we'll bring in the jury please be seated the record will show the presence of the Defendant, the jury, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez, you may continue. With regard to this issue of the defendant's truthfulness, one of the things that you learned as part of your investigation was that the defendant said that after the murder, she had cuts on her hands because she had cut them on apples, right? Yes. And um, did you also hear, for example, other stories other than that she had cut them on her hands on apples while she was cutting apples? Did you hear anything else about that? About the cuts? About the cuts on her hand, how they came about. I, I don't recall hearing any other story other than the cuts on the hands for the apple. Um, and so that's one of the things that you believed when you were talking to the defendant that the cuts that she suffered during this killing were as a result of her cutting apples, right? I didn't believe that. So as you're going along, you're making assessments as to what you believe and what you don't believe, right? Oh, wait a minute. I'm I'm sorry. I was unclear. You're saying that I believe that she got the cuts from the apple. No, I'm saying that isn't it true that your notes reflect the fact that your information is that the cuts the defendant had after this killing resulted when she was slicing apples, right? Right. And you believe that, right? I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't recall that I focused on that as much as what I was retained to do, which was look at whether or not there was domestic violence in the context of the relationship, which was really what I was intended, I mean, what I came on to do. Well, wouldn't you say what was perpetrated on Travis is the ultimate act of domestic violence? Absolutely, what? Even worse. Yeah, and wouldn't you say that the cuts sustained by Jody could realistically have been, um, you know, created or made, if you like, or, or suffered? I don't like to say suffered because I, I like to see her suffer. To be honest, exactly. But, yeah. Um, would it be fair to say that those could have been um, created when she stabbed Travis? It's possible. I mean, don't forget, it's not easy to you, stab someone. You know, your, your hand slips, especially when it's bloody. Yeah, and it takes a lot of force. Yeah. But, you know... So it's possible that happened when she was stabbing him. But it would appear that Alice accepted the explanation of Jody slicing apples and cutting her hands that way as complete gospel. It's crap. Yeah. Um, you know, I think probably she'd, if she could go to a church and an altar and worship her client, I'm starting to think she probably would. Yeah, I'm starting to think that way. I'm not asking you whether or not you focused on that. You understand that? You I under- understand I, that? I understand what you're saying. I'm asking you whether or not you believe the defendant 
when she told you, or the information that you received during this investigation, whether or not you believed that the cuts to her hands were caused while she was cutting apples, green apples. Objection, Judge Foundation, as to when, where this happened. Sustained. Well, ma'am, let me show you your notes about this particular incident, okay? I may need my glasses. The minions would be so proud of you. Take a look at Exhibit 605 and take a look at the highlighted portion. And once you've read the highlighted portion, let me know. You're going to read the entire page so she has context of it. Yes. Did you read the entire page? Yes. May I have it back, please? Sure. This is your handwriting, right? Yes, it is. And this deals with this issue about the cuts on the hands that the defendant received at the time of Travis's death, right? Correct. And in it, your notes reflect that Jody said cuts on her hands were from cutting apples, right? Correct. So with regard to that issue about cutting apples, did you verify whether or not that, that may or may not have been true? No, I did not. You could have gone to collateral sources, like you said, right? I could have. You could have gone, for example, to the police report, right? I could have. You didn't do that, right? I did read the police report. And do you know whether or not there were any statements in that police report of what the defendant said caused the cuts on her hands? No, I don't. But you did read the police report, right? I read the police report very long ago and didn't reread it. So the answer is you did read the police report, right? I did read the police report. And Somehow I think she read the police report, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think she's fully read it now. Do you know whether or not, from your memory, whether or not there was any indication what she said caused the cuts on her hands? No, I don't. One of the things that you told us was that you reviewed, did you re well, let's do it this way, did you review her statements to the police? I did. I reviewed them a long time ago. And I'm I not asking you, am I asking you when you reviewed them, ma'am? You're I'm asking not. me if I reviewed them, and I'm putting that in the context that I reviewed them a very long time ago. I'm not asking you for a context. Do we understand each other? I understand you don't want context. Ma'am, Judge, she's, I would ask that she be admonished for the last comment as to what the prosecutor wants. Yeah, she answered the question. All right, move on. Next question. I can see he's starting to get wound up now, can't you? Yeah, you can hear it in his voice yeah. as well. And you can tell in his demeanour, his... Movements. Yeah, yeah. He's starting to get up there, isn't he? He is. He's going to go all the way to the top soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ma'am, with regard to this particular case, you did review her statements to the police, right? I did. You reviewed the videotapes, right? To the police? Yes. No, I did not. So you just reviewed a transcript of it, right? T correct. And in that transcript, isn't it true that there's a different version of how she cut that finger? I guess there is, because you're telling me, and I don't remember. No, I, I don't want you to... So I don't remember. I don't recall, Mr. Martinez. Let's honestly. Ass All right. I don't let's recall. Assume, let's assume that there were four different versions of how that finger was cut. Objection is characterized as testimony. Assume that there are four different versions of how she cut her fingers. Wouldn't that cause any problems for you in evaluating this case because there clearly is an inconsistency there? Mr. Martinez, people yes lie. Yes or no? No, that would not be a complete answer. All right. Um, no, it would not cause a problem for you, or yes, it would cause a problem for you? I cannot answer that yes or no and be honest about how I answer it. With regard to this case also, you were aware of this issue involving gas cans that the defendant uh, supposedly asked her boyfriend about before she took this trip. You're familiar with that, right? Daryl Brewer. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. You're familiar with that. And you're familiar with that, the fact that before she went on this trip, 
she, call, she asked Mr. Brewer for the use of two gas cans to take on the trip, right? I am. And in fact, that caused you problems, didn't it? I'm not sure what you mean. Well, that caused you problems in terms of the defendant's truthfulness, didn't it? I think he's got a... He sure, certainly bloody has. Yeah. And didn't he get Jodie with this? Yes, he did. Uh, got, <laughs> got her with the gas cans and phew, you can tell by the hesitation. Alice's moral conundrum is now being tested. Yeah, she's faltering. Does she actually have a duty to the truth or will she just blindly defend her client as she has been doing all the way through her testimony? I reckon she'll just try and defend her. So do I. Let's see. You, you look over there. No, no, I'm asking the question. No, no, that I'm... That caused I'm, you problems, didn't it? I don't believe it did, I think. Well, let's take a look at your notes. All right. Let me show you an exhibit first. Okay. To give you a little context, take a look at exhibit 607. Read right. the whole thing and then let me know when you're done. All right. Have you right. read it? Yes, uh huh. That's your handwriting on this particular page, right? Right. And it does reference this issue involving the gas, the borrowing of two gas cans from Daryl Brewer, right? Right, but I, I. Yes or no? Does it? Yes, yes, it does. And it doesn't it indicate that on the last week of May of 2008, Jody told Daryl she needed to borrow two gas cans because she was taking a long trip to Mesa. Doesn't it say that? In part it says that. It does say that though, doesn't it? In part it says that. Well, let's read the whole part. Last week of May of 2008, Jody told Daryl she needed to borrow two gas cans because she was taking a long trip to Mesa and didn't want to run out of gas, right? That's what it says. That's in part what it says. That's not what the rest of it I'm says. I'm talking about the issue involving the, the gas cans. That's all it says about the gas cans, doesn't it? <clears throat> well, it talks I'm about the about trip. The gas cans. Take a look at it. I, I looked at it. I, I took notes on what people said. I took the notes right off what people said. I don't necessarily have a problem with what I said. I took notes to ask questions. And isn't that how you do your did the evaluation in this case? You take what somebody said, and then you look at everything else, and then you come in and tell us that this is domestic violence, right? This doesn't have anything to do, in particular, with the domestic violence I was assessing, Mr. Well, Martinez. You took this, you used the same procedure with regard to this particular issue that you used with regard to any other issue in this case, right? I'm not certain that that would be true, but I, I, I'm not certain what you're referring to. What well, I, did, I did with this case, if you want to know what I did with this no, case. No, I don't want to know what you did with this okay. case. I want to, you to answer my question. And my question to you is, isn't it true that you've been telling us that in this case, you've looked at writings and you reviewed those and took those into account, right? Correct. Isn't that same thing that you did with regard to the gas cans? You read it, you took it into account, and you made notes on it, right? I did. And with regard to that particular issue, that caused you some problems, didn't it? No, the gas cans didn't cause me problems. Isn't it true that you had an issue with that because you believe that perhaps the defendant may not be truthful? Isn't that a problem for you? I think my question was, what does this mean on the side of the page? And I was asking about what that meant. I wanted to get a description of what erratic behavior meant. We've got a saying here in the UK. I don't know whether you've got the same one wherever in the world you're listening or watching, uh, but it's called moving the goalposts. Yeah. And that is exactly what Alice is doing. She is. There is no consistency with her, is there? Absolutely not. But then again, that's just the whip her. She's being so evasive at the moment. She's being evasive. She is bending what she does to suit her own agenda and her client's agenda when being, you know, straight up confronted with, with certain things by Martinez. She gives a side answer, um, or she gives an answer with clarification which isn't needed. No, exactly. <sighs> it's a waste of time. She's getting, she's, she is slowly getting picked apart yeah, by this she, guy. She knows that, and that's why she's nervous, and that's why she's trying to 
think of anything she can just to, you know, defend a client yeah, yeah. and herself. I think I'm I'm not sure whether we actually see her physically come apart on this stand, but it wouldn't surprise me if we did. Yeah, well, I, I hope so. Yeah, she might melt like a bloody snowflake in the heat. Yeah, like Jodie did. Yeah. Actually, isn't it true, ma'am, that what you <coughs> thought back then is why did the defendant want to borrow two gas cans from Daryl? Did she know she was going Objection. to... Objection. He's reading from something that's not been marked or in evidence. Sustained. Isn't it true that you were concerned that she had told you about the trip and now you have this issue about her going to Mesa and then you said... I thought this was a last-minute decision. Didn't that create a problem for you? I, I didn't hear the question. Isn't it true that you had questions about it because you thought it was a last-minute decision to go to Mesa? I still think it was a last-minute decision. Do you remember what I said earlier about truth versus blindly defending your client? Yeah. There you go, we've got our answer. <laughs> exactly. And that caused you problems in the context of exhibit number 607, which is what she told you about Daryl and the gas cans, right? I had a problem. Well, that's what, that's what, take a look at I had a question. You're, you're saying a problem. I had a question. Take a look at 608. See if you recognize the highlight the whole page. I, I did yes, ask her that. <coughs> Ma'am, did you read Exhibit 608? Yes, I did. That's in your handwriting, right? Correct. And in fact, the approach that you took here were some looking at things that you had problems with in this case. Right? I had questions about it. Questions that you had in this case, right? Yes. And one of the questions that you had in this case involved the gas cans, didn't it? Yes, it did. And in fact, you indicated that you, your words were something to the effect of you thought it was a last-minute decision and it was creating a conflict for you, right? I wanted to make sure that it was a last-minute decision. I had questions that I wrote throughout, and I asked those questions. And that was one of the questions that you had, was that yes. you thought this was the last-minute decision, right? Yes. And thinking that it was a last-minute decision, in your mind, it did not make any sense that she would go to Daryl Brewer and ask for two gas cans to go to Mesa, because that happened many days before the trip started, right? Objection is mischaracterizing what Ms. Arias actually said. She never said that. The, the summary of the notes are not what Ms. Arias said. Overruled. You may continue. Nice try, Miss Snappy Pants. Okay. Okay. You may answer. Oh. Um, I had a question about the gas cans, and one of the questions I had was because I don't know how far Utah is from Wairika. I wanted to know why she needed gas cans. That's all. But and, you're and, and I wanted to know if there was a decision to go to Mesa, which I had written, and later in that same page, it talks about the trip to Southern California and Utah. So I wasn't clear about whether Mesa was an intended trip or not. And I well, want to find out whether it was. Do you believe that Alice ever for one second, just one brief second, or maybe even a nanosecond, question Jodie's guilt. I don't think for a second did she do that. I don't either. She... I think that once she got paid to do this case, she just thought, right, she's innocent. She was a victim of domestic violence. That's how I'm going to go forward. But she didn't realise what Martinez was going to do. Well, she didn't realise how he would pick apart not just, you know, the way that she um, works on this case, but her whole attitude towards a client and expose just how biased she is. Well, she is. I mean, it seems to me that even if every story she's told, it's always been the man that's been the bad one. It's either been the man that's been the bad one or Jodie 
Not, not just, you know, not talking about the stories that she's told, obviously. You know, she's a man-hater, as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, Jodie could absolutely do no wrong. She's Snow White. She's Doris Day. You know, she's Maria Von Trapp. She's Marilyn Monroe. She's flawless, you know what I mean, and can do no wrong. Whereas Travis is a monster, as far as she's concerned. Because he's a man. Yeah. Not just because she's a man, but, but because he dared to stand up to Jodie. That's why, I think. I think that's why she thinks he's a monster. Are you saying, ma'am, that you did not write in your notes last week of May 8th, 8th, Jody told... It's not in evidence. Absolutely am. I'm I'm impeaching her now with the statement because if if you want, I'll address it. Judge, it's not... Approach, counsel. What you've been telling us is that you took statements from a number of people, and we call them collateral sources, right? Correct. And you looked at those statements from other people, these collateral sources, and then you compared them to other collateral sources and any statements by the defendant, right? Correct. In this particular case, you viewed the statement of a collateral source, right? I did. Daryl Brewer, right? Correct. And during and in viewing the statement of Daryl Brewer. There was this statement about the defendant requesting or asking to borrow some gas cans in late May of 2008, right? Correct. And with regard to this statement from Mr. Brewer involving the gas cans being borrowed in 2008, the indication was that the defendant told him she needed to borrow two gas cans because she was taking a long trip to Mesa and didn't want to run out of gas, right? Correct. In terms of you saying... Utah and talking about Utah and how far Utah is. This page, ma'am, take a look at it again. It has no mention of Utah whatsoever, does it? Read it. Jody said she was going to visit. No, no, read it to yourself. It does mention Utah. And it mentions it at the very bottom, doesn't it? No, it mentions it uh, a par- about in the... Same paragraph as, as the question about Mason. It mentions the Grand Canyon. All right, go ahead. Let me get it back. Okay. But it mentions Utah, man, after she goes to Mesa, right? It says Mesa, and then it says the other things. Right. It talks about what she's going to do, it, but it doesn't talk about Utah first, does it? No. And that created a problem for you, didn't it? I had to ask a question. Didn't it? It created a question for me. Okay, it created a question for you because you thought this decision to go to Mesa was a last minute decision, right? Correct. And what you did is, with regard to this issue, even though you reviewed a statement to the police and all the other items in this case, you decided to resolve this conflict or this question in favor of the defendant, right? Definitely speaks to bias, doesn't it? <sighs> Absolutely. I don't think you could get a more obvious example than that, could you? No, you couldn't. I asked the, the defendant about it. She told me that she was going to, that she had not said she was going to Mesa. She was going to Utah. And the, the, also the um, journals indicated and the IMs when they were talking about planning trips. So I used other things to look at that. But yes, I had a question about it for sure. And you decided to resolve it in favor of the defendant irrespective of what you used, right? Irrespective of what sources you used, right? No, in in respect to to other sources I used. And I don't remember the police report. I'm very sorry, I, I don't remember that. With this, with regard to this issue as to whether or not she was going to Mesa first, ma'am, isn't it a fact that you could have just called or had an interview with Mr. Brewer to try to determine what it was that he said? You could have done that, right? You do that as part of your investigations, don't you? I could have, but I was basically told to rely on the information that I had. Well, now, now you're indicating that you were restricted somehow by somebody. I don't want to know who was, you, you were restricted by. Did, have you ever voiced an objection here during testimony that you were ever restricted in your approach in this case? No.
who told her just to focus on what they've got? No one would de- tell an expert to do that. Well, no, I mean... It, and especially in this type of trial. Could, could it be Wilmot or, or Nermi? If, obviously, you know, I don't believe that, but <laughs> if it was true, who could possibly tell her to focus on what they had? I mean, could it be Samuels? Could it be Nermi? Could it be Wilmot? Wilmot? Who could have possibly told her? I don't think anyone's told her. And why would she not say to them, well, let me do my job my own way. I'm I'm the domestic violence expert. You're the lawyer. You do your job. I'll do mine. I need everything to hand. Yeah. That's ridiculous. And in this case, you, no one was directing your investigation, was it? Were they? No. You're independent. In other words, you have an independent assessment. Here to make an independent assessment, right? Yes. And as part of that investigation, you could have spoken to Daryl Brewer to see whether or not what he told, what his recollection was, right? I asked about interviewing other people, and I was given the the information, the collateral sources. Right, proper damage control coming from snappy pants here, isn't there? Yeah, or trying. She can see that this is falling apart and she's doing everything she can to stop the bleeding. Yeah, and well, she's trying, but it's not going to work. It's not going to work, no. It's like it's like knitting fog, isn't it, as I always say. Or plaiting sawdust. Yeah. Isn't it true, then, that with regard to your finding that there was domestic violence in this case because you didn't do this interview, isn't and it talks about different stories. Isn't it true that your assessment of domestic violence is deficient? No, I don't believe it is. Even though you didn't interview Mr. Brewer, correct? I yes re- or no? I, I, I don't want to get any further than yes or no on this one. Okay. I didn't interview Mr. Brewer. And even though you didn't interview, because you didn't interview Mr. Brewer, your assessment in this case at least to a certain extent, is lacking. I don't think so. So how the hell can she consider herself an expert when even the smallest little detail, especially in a domestic violence case, and an expert, nothing should be overlooked, and she overlooked it? Yeah. Um, Attention to detail in cases like this is absolutely key. Of course it is. And... She has overlooked so much in this case when it comes to, you know, evidence, you know, pure evidence. She's overlooked it. She's ignored it. Or she's considered not important. Yeah, you're quite right. How can she call herself an expert when she's not doing a thorough job? She's not. Not at all. And you didn't interview... Well, you're the one that told us that with regard to these kinds of things. Um conversations are only part of uh, conversations can form a part of your investigation right you did say that though right yes or no the conversations are part of my right and in fact in other cases you have conducted interviews with other people correct in most murder cases I have not so I've used collateral sources so you're saying that with regard to your um, assessments in criminal cases, don't restrict it to, 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 to murder cases. With regard to the criminal cases, what you're saying is you don't interview other people, you just interview the defendant and look at collateral sources. Is that right? Is that it, what you're de- saying? it depends on the case and it depends on what is available for me to review. In some cases, there are financial restrictions. They say these interviews have been done. Um, I'm giving those interviews. So it depends on the attorney, and it well, depends, and it doesn't matter whether it's the prosecution or the defense, Mr. Martinez. It's there's a limit to what they give me. And I'm, I'm really not asking you to go into that, and if you don't mind not going into that area okay. that you just went into, okay? Right. I'm just asking you whether or not it's a yes or no, and if you can't answer yes or no, tell me, and we'll move on. All right? Okay. With regard to uh, your other criminal cases, isn't it true that in those other other criminal cases, on occasion? You have conducted interviews. Yes or no? Um, 
I, I really am reflecting on the criminal cases, trying to reflect on the criminal cases that I have done. Why does she have to think of one? Can't she just think of one she's done or has she even done a criminal case? She might have thought of quite a few. She's just cherry picking which one. That's cut. That could be an explanation. Generally, it's been paperwork. Generally means that you have, at least on a couple of occasions. I'm, I'm leaving it open because I know that you are, you know, it's like very precise and I am not certain. So, so you don't know what you're saying? Yes, I'm not certain. Ma'am, one of the things that your investigation revealed in this case, and we've talked about this issue of secondary gain, and we talked about some inconsistencies here. Uh, one of the things that your investigation revealed was that the defendant is very manipulative, isn't she? I don't think that my, I, I don't believe I said she was very manipulative. Isn't it true that you reviewed collateral sources that indicated the defendant was very manipulative? There were collateral sources that said she was manipulative. Right. Isn't it true that, in fact, it was people that were close to her who indicated, for example, that... May we approach? You may approach. ...that the defendant was manipulative, correct? Yes. In fact, you received information that the defendant was not abused. She just... Overruled to that question. Isn't it true that your investigation revealed that she was not abused, but liked to play the victim, and that's part of the manipulation? I don't recall that. That expression she just had on her face was something like, I would never, ever, ever think something like that about her. How, you know, perish the thought. Yeah, I know, but... I know, but I think the whole thought of that just filled out Alice with horror. <laughs> really did. Let's take a look at your notes. Okay. Take a look at Exhibit 609, read the whole thing, and if you don't mind concentrating on the highlighted portion. Have you read the whole page? Well, I scanned it. Go ahead and read the whole page, please. You reviewed it, correct? Yes, I did. Isn't it true that your investigation revealed that the defendant like to play the victim. This was about high school, Mr. Martinez. Whether or not it's from high school, ma'am, isn't it true that that's part of something that you thought it was important enough to write down? What, let, let me answer that correctly. Let me answer that fully. I took notes on every interview and I wrote down the essence of the notes. In that particular interview with Zaina, her, her high school friend or junior high friend, her friend was talking about Jody liking to play the victim, and that was in junior high or high school. So that was a piece of what I took into consideration, sure. And playing the victim and being manipulative, that's a character trait, isn't it? It doesn't have to be a character trait. It can well, be a, a transient situation. It can be situational, Mr. Martinez. It can be situational, but there's no indication anywhere that this was any, this was a situational thing, was it? It's the observation of one other young girl. Who knew her well at the time that she was growing up, right? A young girl. Right, whether, so you're saying that when an individual is of a certain age, there's, you can't pay attention to what they say, right? No, I paid attention to what she said and right. weighed it with the other things that I read. So you did consider this information, is what you're telling us, sure. in making this assessment. And the information that you considered was that Growing up, the defendant liked to play the victim, right? From one source. That was I, one source. That did, was I ask, not... did I ask you what source? I did not, did I? I guess I'm trying to figure out if you want a complete answer or not. I, wanted, I want you to answer my questions. 
Did, isn't it true that you just told me that you considered this information? Yes or no? Yes, I considered it. Isn't it true that the information that you considered was that the defendant was not abused, that, but she liked to play the victim? Yes or no? Contrary to other sources, yes. I, am I asking you about contrary sources, ma'am? Contrary yes no? to other sources, yes, that would be true. I've just noticed something. I don't know if you've noticed it, and I don't know if anybody out there has noticed it. But in some ways, Alice is testifying very, very similarly to Jody in terms of the way she is doing it. She is qualifying her answers. She is not answering the question directly. She's dancing around it. And Playing she's, for time. Yeah, she's putting qualifiers in. Jody did that. Yeah, of course she did. So I am guessing that a lot went on behind the scenes um, in Shea Team Jody, if you like. Oh, I'm I've, sure it did. I'm pretty sure that Samuels and Alice, between them both, coached Jody on how to testify. Because there are similarities between both of them in the way that they testify with the way that Jody testified. I, I, I don't know if I'm the only person to see that. Well, who knows? Maybe Martinez has noticed it. Maybe he has, but and maybe he brings it up. I don't know. We've yet to see that if it happens. But it's just struck me the the way she is testifying is very similar to the manner in which Jody testified. Yeah. And that's weird. And I'm not asking you about contrary sources. I'm asking you whether or not that's something that you consider. Yes or no? Yes. And this information that she, whatever it was, the term is manipulative, this is something that you had when you were considering this whole issue of, of abuse, right? Correct. And again, you gave the benefit of the doubt to the defendant because you never even asked her about it, right? Did you even ask the defendant about her playing the victim? I asked her about that report, but I also looked at so statements did. from Jody's mother, Jody's sisters, Jody's grandparents, and, and, Jody's, and Jody's siblings in, in looking at the issue of Jody playing the victim. Do you see what I mean about the lack of consist consistency? Absolutely. She, she claimed not to know anything about what Jody's father said earlier, and yet she claims to have read everything that... You know, her parents had to have said and, if, you know, reviewed everything about the... <sighs> if she had read everything that her parents said, then she would have read that. Yeah. So she would have known. Yeah, she would have known. Like I said, lack of consistency, clear bias towards a client and, you know, just a, a clear desire, as far as I can see, to cheat justice. Yeah, and now she's getting caught up in a web of lies. Yeah but you didn't speak to the defendant herself directly about it, did you? I don't recall if I did or not. Your note, do your notes reflect that you ever talked to the defendant about that? My notes don't reflect everything I talked to the victim. Or well, the, what did it have been important about. in this case, since we're talking about abuse, to ask the defendant whether or not she had manipulated people into thinking she'd been abused before? I had talked to her about being abused before, and I never got an impression from her or from other collaterals that she was in the habit of playing the victim. And what I'm looking for are patterns of behavior here, Mr. Martinez, not isolated instances. I'm not asking about patterns. I'm asking about whether or not you asked her specifically about this issue, about her being accused of playing the victim when she was not abused. Objection. Asking. I do not recall. If I and, ask her specifically. And, but isn't that what we're here to discuss? Whether or not the defendant was abused in a domestic violence situation? Isn't that what we're here to discuss? Yes. And so... In the relationship with Mr. Alexander. I understand that, but we're talking about abuse though, right? We're talking about the relationship specifically with Mr. Alexander. And, and if in an other circumstance, the individual had pretended to be a victim of abuse, you don't consider that to, that to be important okay. in, your, in your assessment. This characterizes the notes that were on there and her testimony. Overall, you may answer the question. No other collaterals 
suggest that Ms. Arias is playing the victim or that she did. In fact, they talk about her being a victim of her father and her mother at times. Do you consider this information to be so unimportant that you didn't consider it? In this information, was it so unimportant to you that you didn't even address it with the defendant? I am sure I addressed it to some degree. Then tell me what she said with regard to this issue about playing the victim. Tell me. Nothing that stands out in my mind. So you can't tell me anything, correct, about what she I said? I can tell you that she had... Yes or no? Can you tell me anything that she said with regard to this issue? I cannot tell you specifics, no. Let's face it, she never bloody brought it up, did she? It was never even a factor, it was never even mentioned. Well, no, because if it was, it would have been a bad thing for her. Yeah, it would have been somewhat of a factor. But once again, I don't think it would have put her off taking the case. Oh, of course not. Not at all. Ma'am, the other thing that we know is that not only is there this indication that she was manipulated at that age, isn't it true that... After I she the testimony, manipulative at that age. That's not what it was. Sustained rephrase. With regard, isn't it true that we know that at that age, whatever the age that was, that she was perceived to be somebody who played the victim, even though she was not abused. In addition to that, isn't it true that your investigation revealed? Overruled. Overruled. Isn't it true that your investigation revealed that after she killed Mr. Alexander, she was very manipulative? After she killed, well, yes. part one, I have one collateral source that says she was manipulative. So when you characterize me saying that she was manipulative, that is incorrect. Do you remember that shit t-shirt that Jody made? Yeah. Well... Why didn't she have one printed up for Alice saying, please don't hurt Jody and have her wear it in the courtroom today? Yeah, that would have been a blast. Part two is, yes, she... I, I'm not sure what you're talking about in terms, if you could describe what you mean by manipulative. No. Afterwards, I would be... I'm would asking you whether or not you remember, as you're sitting there, any information from any source indicating that the defendant was manipulative uh, after, shortly after... She killed Mr. Alexander. Manipulative regarding what or to whom? Manipulative is, is, do you understand what the word manipulative means, right? Well, I'm not sure how you mean it, Mr. No. Mr. Martinez. Use the Webster di Dictionary um, uh, in the, uh, definition of it. What does manipulative mean to you? Manipulative can mean manipulating facts. It can be, manip it can be Deceiving people, if you're, is that what you're asking me? I'm asking you for your definition of manipulative. That's what I'm asking. If you you're for. asking me if she. No, I'm not. I'm asking for a definition of Webster's. He's not allowing her to finish her answer. Overruled. Ask your next question. Give me your definition of manipulative, whatever it may be. My definition? Yes, as you applied it in this case. Asked an answer. She already answered this question. Overall, to may answer the question. That someone can manipulate or deceive or... Um, gee, I haven't been asked for a Webster's Dictionary definition, but basically that, that you can uh, manipulate data means you can change them, that you can... Uh, that you can deceive or tell half-truths that, you know. So by her own definition, she is being manipulative because she is altering the truth. Yeah, at the moment she's dancing around it as well. Yeah, and manipulating it for her clients. So not only is Jody manipulative, so is Alice. Yeah, and that's why your testimony has no credibility. Exactly. And with regard to the defendant, isn't it true that you received information that she was manipulative shortly after, in her relationship with men, shortly after the killing. With men? Yes. With what men? Well, do you remember, 
do you have it? Do you even have any memory of your notes involving the defend what the defendant did after she returned to Wairika? Objection, argumentative. Oh. Are you talking about her trip to see Ryan in Utah? No. no Are you no, talking no. about her experience in the restaurant? I'm not. I I have no idea what specifically, Mr. Martinez, you're talking about. Do you remember her experiences at the Purple Plum? Do you remember yes. Yes. that? Yes. Uh-oh, he's brought up the Purple Plum again. Now I've got visions in my head. <laughs> I wonder what kind. And do you remember that you have information involving the Purple Plum with regard to uh, her interaction with men? Yes. And that interaction with men uh, indicated that she Objection, was... Objection, Judge. May. I may continue. Ma'am, do you need your notes to refresh your recollection as to the incident at the Purple Club? Is this regarding, there were several interviews about the Purple Plum, so I'm not sure which one, which interview you're referring to, Mr. Martinez? I'm referring to the one involving whether or not the defendant was manipulated with men. There was, there was an interview with uh, a waitress uh, who said she was manipulative um, or, or only, only, was only nice to uh, good-looking men. Of course she was. Yeah, it's only men she was, she was interested in. That's all who she would be nice to. Yeah. And I bet every time a dishy bloke walked into her restaurant, her arsehole was gaping. Yeah, and then the top would pro pro possibly open? Possibly, yes, to reveal two tablets on an <laughs> ironing board. How about the interview with the manager, Carrie Franklin? Are you familiar with that? I am familiar with it. I don't remember every detail of it, if you want All right, me let me go ahead and provide that to you then. Sure. Take a look at Exhibit 610. They treat it all, including the margins. Sure. I may have it back. You're done reviewing it, correct? Yes, I am. This is your. This. These notes are in your handwriting, correct? Yes, they are. And you completed them as part of your investigation in this case, correct? I was taking notes on on the interview. Yes. And this is what you did with regard to this investigation. You would look at collateral sources and you would take notes, correct? Correct. And you would use them, either then or later, uh, as part of the evaluation. It's something you considered, right? Yes. And in this particular case, there was an individual that was the manager of the Purple Plum, right? Correct. And you talked to the defendant. She worked at the Purple Plum at some point, right? Yes, she did. And when she worked at the Purple Plum, there was this indication or your investigation revealed was that the defendant was manipulative towards men, right? Objection Foundation. I mean, the state. Well, ma'am, what do your notes indicate that, uh, um, well, do you want the date, ma'am? Take a look at the date uh, on Exhibit 610, if that refreshes your recollection as to when this happened. I'll, I'll point it out to you. Okay. What date are we talking about where this manipulation occurred? June 13th, 08. So that's nine days after she murdered Travis and she's trying to hook other guys in. Well, she tried it six hours after she killed Ryan Travis. Ryan Burns, yeah. yeah. This swamp donkey has absolutely no shame, does she? She's a, she's a slut, that's what she is. Yeah, and then some. And during this manipulation it involved men the defendant and men correct correct and specifically it involved the defendant um her interaction with men correct correct and your investigation revealed that she would feign approach please and the part of the investigation that you found out was that the defendant was manipulative in her interaction with men, correct? Judge, objection. Overruled. You may answer yes correct. or no. Sit down, Jennifer. Shut 
up. Yeah, let Martinez do his job. He let you do yours. She was flirtatious with him. I don't know if she was manipulated with him. She, he says she used them. All right. Using men, given your previous uh, definition, that's someone who's manipulative, correct? That would be correct. And so, given that, isn't that something that you, it's something that you considered and ultimately rejected in favor of the defendant, right? Actually, I looked at behavior after the homicide, and that was after the homicide. Right. That I would consider would be aberrant behavior, uh, and according to other, her other history in working in restaurants, that was never part of it. Uh, and at working at Casa Ramos, that was not part of it, according to the owner. So I looked at behavior after the murder, or after the killing, and I would say that unusual aberrant behavior would be part of that. And that's your assessment, if you will, of her behavior, correct? Yes. And that's your assessment of her behavior, even though the indications are what they are as part of the investigation, correct? The indications... The indications, they're, they're contrary indications with Casa Ramos different than, differently than Purple Plum. Yeah, but my, question, my point is that you decided to disregard these indications that she was manipulative as part of your assessment in this, as part of your opinion in this case, right? I didn't disregard them, I considered them. You considered them but chose to find them to not be of enough value to factor in into your assessment, right? The only thing Alice considered of value was the fee she was getting for this case. Spot on. I factored in behavior prior, her behavior toward men prior to the killing. I factored in her behavior with both restaurants. I factored them all in. You've already told us that, but my question to you is more pointed. You came in here and you indicated that the defendant was manipulated by Mr. Alexander, correct? Abused by Mr. Alexander. All right, he was, and that's, that, that has a component of manipulation, correct? Yes, it would. And in fact, in this particular case, what we have is the defendant ex exhibiting manipulative behavior after she killed him, right? Correct. And what you're saying is, even though she's exhibiting manipulative behavior, I'm not going to believe that manipulative behavior. That's what you're saying, right? No, I'm not, you're... no I'm not saying that. Oh, yes, you are. Because according to you, the sun shines beautiful heavenly rays from Jody's gaping backside. Well said. So you I'm do saying believe... I believe that, that she could have been manipulative with men at that time. I'm not, it... I'm not disregarding that. If she is manipulative with men, you would agree that Travis Alexander was a man, right? I said she was... Yes or no? ...her testimony as to when the manipula supposed manipulation took place. Overall. Yes or no? Was Mr. Alexander a man? Yes, he was. Despite the smile, you can tell that hurt her to say. Yeah, and it also looks as if the defence is worrying now. Oh, they're shitting themselves, mate, trust me. And th you just told us that she could be manipulative with men. You just told us that, right? I said at this period of time, she was manipulative. And in Casa Ramos, which was during that period of time, the, the statements were that she wasn't. So I have no evidence prior to Mr. Alexander that she was manipulative with men. What, I just what, don't have that evidence. What you're telling me is that somebody is telling you, according to you here, that... <coughs> There's no information on the left side, but on the right side, somebody's being very specific that she's manipulative, right? That's what you're, you're telling us, right? Objection is characterized as the testimony of specific as to manipulation. There's no specificity. Uh, overall. Right? That's specific. what you're telling us. You have two competing views, according to you, right? I have competing views. Yes or no? After the killing. Yes or no. You have two competing views. Casa Ramos on the left side, Purple Plum on the right side. 
You have two competing views, right? Those two comp competing right. views. And what you decided to do as part of this evaluation is tell me, well, I believed what people were saying at Casa Ramos, right? No, I did not say that. Well, you are disbelieving what people are saying at the Purple Plum, right? I am also looking at... Yes or no? Are you disbelieving what people are saying? I have plum? other information about what people said at the Purple Plum that I also took into account, Mr. Martinez. And so what you're saying is that you're disbelieving what was said at the Purple Plum about her being manipulative. That's what you're telling me, right? Even if I say I believe that she was manipulative at that time, it doesn't mean I believe as a characteristic that she is. No, because you're not being paid to, love, are you? No, you're, pe you're being paid there to lie for her and to try and get her off. Yeah, and to toe the line and to toe the narrative. That is what she is being paid for. Anything else? Nah. Even this the truth doesn't matter to her. This woman is despicable. Yeah, she is, and then some. I could believe that she was manipulative at that time. It does not, it's situational. It doesn't mean that I believe as a characteristic of Miss Arias that she's a manipulative person. And what we know with regard to this assessment is that when she was younger, she was, we have information from you that she was not abused and she liked to play the victim, right? Yeah, you have that information, right? You, you're sorry, just characterizing. The don't answer the question. I'm sorry, repeat the objection. The, the question is mischaracterizing the testimony. Overruled, you may answer. Right, you, you told us about that when she was younger, right? That you have that information, right? I have one friend yes saying that. Yes or no? I have one friend, yes, or yes no. one friend. And then you're now telling her, and this is when she was younger, right? And now you have her immediately after the murder, five days after the murder, exhibiting manipulative behavior, yes or no? Yes. So what you're saying though is at one, you have an, ex an expanse of years in between, right? Yes. And what you're choosing to say is, well, even though there was this behavior here when she was younger, and there's the same behavior when she was older, you're choosing to say that was aberrant. That is not something that was a characteristic of hers. That's what you're saying, right? I'm saying that what I hear from one teenage friend of hers is limited compared to what I heard from other sources in regard to Miss Arias. And so there is a preponderance of evidence on the one side and not on the other. What the hell is she talking about? She only talked to one person. She didn't talk to anybody from Jodie's childhood. She didn't talk to her parents, didn't talk to anybody except Jodie. So how can there be a preponderance of evidence when she didn't speak to anybody other than a bloody client? God, this woman is an absolute piece of work. Well, not only that, she only did one part of the investigation. Yeah, she was shoddy, she was work shy, and she skewed her, oh, her whole testimony in one direction and refused to see the other side. Exactly. Now, when you are appearing as an expert in a court case, you have, you have a duty to the truth. Not to somebody's version of the truth, but to the truth over, overall. I think in this case, Alice and the truth have been on, they've not even been on nodding acquaintance. They've not even passed each other. They're hemispheres apart. She probably wouldn't know the truth that they jumped up and smacked her in the face. Do you know something? All of you guys out there that have, you know, when we were working up towards this and you were saying to us, you know, wait until Alice gets on the, on the stand and just see how unbelievably biased and... What an absolute piece of work she was. We, you know, I, I believed you all. Didn't, well, we both did, didn't we? Yeah. But we never thought she would be this bad. Oh, <laughs> my God. She, unbelievable. That's and what you're what saying, I'm is, saying is that your standard that you use when evaluating this, this uh, evidence, the preponderance of the evidence? Is that what you're using? One is more likely true than not? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that when I have numerous collateral no, no, no. sources. I'm not no, I'm asking I, for your definition of preponderance of evidence. And I'm, telling, than, and I'm going to tell you what it is. Is it, my question is more pointed than that. Does it mean more likely than not? No. You're using it differently. I am. What's the standard in one sentence that preponderance of the evidence means to you? For me, preponderance of evidence means that I have looked at all of the evidence that I have available to me. Uh, no, you haven't. 
and I have gone through it and looked at what appears to be the truth. What for me makes sense, what for me, after I weigh all of the evidence, makes the most sense to me. And that's what I have to go on. What I have been presented with is what I have to go on. And your definition of preponderance, then, is what appears to be the truth. That's what you just said, in part, right? In weighing the evidence. Right. What, and so, in a sense, what you're saying is you're a human lie detector, right? Because whatever may appear to be the truth to you may not appear to be the truth to somebody else, right? I would not call myself a human lie detector. I think well, that you characterizes me. You evaluate this in terms of what appears to be the truth to you, then, right? Right? And that's... The and, context of what I'm saying today. And what appears to be the truth to you in this case, in terms of the purple plum and the Casa Ramos example, to you, the Casa Ramos example appears to be the truth. I yes or no? I didn't say that. Well, we were talking about it in the context of the purple plum. Didn't you tell us that that's what appeared to be the truth to you? This characterizes her testimony. No. Oh, the answer. I said that, that the, what they said at the purple plum could be true. So she's finally admitted that what they said at the Purple Plum could be true, but she's always maintained that what they said at Casa Ramos is true. Exactly, so she's believing one over the other. Exactly, uh, with <laughs> the same amount of evidence for both, yet yeah. she chooses to believe one over the other. So she could be manipulative towards men at that point, right? I said that yes situationally... It yep. appeared that could be true. So that was their perception. So if it's true that she could be manipulative towards men on June 13th of 2008, it could also stand to reason that a week or two weeks before, let's just go with two weeks, two weeks before that, she could also be manipulative towards men, correct? It doesn't stand to reason. I'm sorry, the objection? Speculation. Overruled. It Correct. doesn't stand to reason. I know you're saying that this is your view of what you believe is the truth, but isn't it based on the continuum that we've established here? Young, right after the murder, isn't it also true that it could be true that she was manipulative before the murder? Objection. Because it... Approach. You may continue. With regard to this issue of manipulation, it could be that we've seen two instances of manipulation here, correct? Objection made, foundation. Sustained rephrase. You told us about an incident that you investigated when she was a teenager, and you told us about an incident that you investigated on June 13th of 2008, correct? Correct. Prior to those are incidents that can be characterized as manipulative, is what you told me, right? Objection is characterized as an, as an incident when she was a teenager. There's no incident. Overall. Correct? That wasn't an incident. These statements that were made when she was a teenager and somebody saying that she played the victim when she wasn't abused could be characterized as manipulative, yes or no? Is the evidence overruled? You may answer. Correct. They could. And you've already talked about the the case involving the purple plum, and that could also be characterized as manipulative. Correct. Yes, it could. Do you remember that we talked yesterday about a text message that was sent by the defendant um, to Mr. Alexander? And this text message was sent mistakenly. Do you remember that, that we talked about yesterday? Yes. It was to an individual named Stephen. Do you remember that? Yes. And that, as part of that text message being sent out, Mr. Alexander became upset, right? He became saw very that upset. Right. And then the defendant created another text message and sent it, and it was almost the same as the first one. Do you remember we discussed that? Yes. Could it be that this individual that uh, is manipulative, given those two incidents, could have sent that text message 
just to get a rise out of Mr. Alexander and manipulate him into paying attention to her? Before she answers this question, I'm going to take a wild stab in the dark and she's going to say, no, that's not possible. <laughs> of course she is. Are you asking me hypothetically if, if someone who is not known to be manipulative with other men that she's with and spent incredible amounts of time with, if she could do a manipulative behavior, are you asking me if she it's possible for sure. her to do something? Isn't it possible that that was manipulative also? It's possible that most of us have done something I'm not manipulative. asking about you. I'm not asking about me. I'm asking about her. It's certainly possible. Well, I was wrong and I don't mind admitting it, but that is something she would definitely say. No, that's not possible. Anything to defend a client. Oh, yeah, absolutely anything, the cow. But I am absolutely happy to hold up my hands and say, yeah, I was wrong about that. Yep, so was I. And with regard to her going to visit Ryan Burns, one of the, you, you talked to her about that, right? Yes. And when she went to visit Mr. Burns, one of the things that happened was that they were involved in some sort of um, sexual contact. They had sexual relations. Do you, understand, do you know about that? They were making out. And during the time that they were making out, one of the things that the defendant, do you know why the defendant was making out so shortly after the killing? Do you remember what she told you about that? I remember that she was trying to act normal. She was trying, which is another form of manipulation, isn't it? I don't, I think that's manipulating yourself. I think it's trying to make yourself feel normal in a situation that isn't. Well, ma'am, if she has Mr. Burns laying down, and she gets on top of him and straddles him. Do you really think that she's trying to make herself feel normal? Or do you think she's trying to make him feel normal? Do I think... Ma'am, we have... I, I, I don't know who she... I think she's trying to feel normal. I think I would want to feel normal or anybody would want to feel normal so, after so, what happened. And this begs the question, has Alice ever got up and straddled anybody? I don't or, think or has anyone straddled Alice? I really don't think anyone has bothered. Because, you know, if someone had straddled Alice, or indeed if Alice has straddled someone, <laughs> then she would know exactly how it feels when you are the straddler or the straddly. Exactly. Right? So she knows exactly what Jodie was trying to do. I don't think she was trying to act normal. Obviously, she was trying to put Ryan, you know, make him feel horny, and then, you know to pardon the, the vernacular, take away the pussy at the end. Yeah. <laughs> or in that case, the arsehole. I mean, all it was, t he was like a pawn to her. Yeah, a pawn. Literally, a pawn. Yeah. Yeah. So you're now in, 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 interjecting yourself into this. You're saying that your standards mm. are that if you killed somebody, you would that same day go and have some sort of sexual relations with somebody else. That's the standard that you want to apply? You know, I'm not saying that, Mr. Well, ma'am, isn't that what you said? If I were, didn't you just tell me that? Let me rephrase that. I'm not asking you to rephrase it. I'm asking you a question. Didn't you just say, if I, if it were, or if, if it were me, something to that effect? I, I think you probably know that the answer to that is, I that is not my standard. As great as it is to see one tearing her apart, that is a little disingenuous, just to be balanced. When she said, if it were me, I would want to feel normal, I don't think she was referring to killing someone and then having sex with someone else. I think she was just referring to the actual act, not to the murder before, but what, that's just a, a nitpicking thing. It is a little disingenuous, but it doesn't take away from the fact that I'm enjoying the hell out of this. Yeah, me too. Yeah, just wanted to provide that for balance, that's all. No. You don't, ma'am. I don't go and... and ma'am behave we don't re you, you understand that your standards personal standards are unimportant here correct okay but you keep interjecting it by saying if it were me do you do you agree then that by you saying if it were me you are attempting to interject your standards here right i misspoke that's the understatement of the censure when with regard to your standards in fact there was an issue that was created in this case because of your standards wasn't there I don't know what you're referring to. Do you remember that you told me in our interview that you didn't ask certain questions of the defendant because you were old-fashioned and you were embarrassed? 
Oh, it's sexual questions? Ma'am, isn't it true that you told uh, me that you were old-fashioned, yes or no? There were sexual questions I did not ask because they do not come easy to me to ask. Yes, that's true. Then excuse me, but what the bloody hell are you doing as a domestic violence expert? Because the two things go hand in hand. Of and course in, they do. Yeah, and in order to be a professional, you have to be professional enough to ask uncomfortable questions. It's the only way to get the truthful full answers and to get everything, you know, clarified. Jesus, where did she study Ringling Brothers? <laughs> Probably spit an image. You, it was much more strong than that. You indicated that you were old-fashioned, yes or no? Yeah, I'm old-fashioned. And... And it's because you were old-fashioned, that restricted you in asking the defendant certain questions involving the sexual aspect of Mr. Alexander, hers and Mr. Alexander's um, relationship, right? I read about them. Ma'am, I, I know you want to tell me that you read about them, but isn't I, it true that I, you did not ask her about them, right? I asked about them later, after I had spoken with you, after our interview in November, there was a sex tape, I, I did ask her questions. I'm not asking about the sex tape, ma'am. I'm asking... There were questions I did not ask during, that I had not asked when you and I um, had our interview, and there were questions I asked after that. Here's the way it works, Alice. Juan Martinez asks you a question, and you answer it. It's simple. Isn't it true that, first of all, you told me that you were old-fashioned, right? Well, the stain. After that, isn't it true that you are now telling us that you then went to talk to the defendant, right? I asked her some questions. You did go to talk to the defendant after our interview, right? Correct. You were still old-fashioned. You were even older when you went to talk to her, right? Objection. Afterwards. I was... Well, your standard of being old-fashioned hadn't changed from the first time to the second time when you went to visit her, had it? My, yes or no? My standard changed because I was exposed to a lot of things that I needed to find out about. I'm not a, so now you're saying that when you went back to talk to the defendant, you were no longer old-fashioned in your approach to this assessment in this case. You haven't defined old-fashioned. Well, ma'am. Maybe you need to do that for me, uh, or maybe I need to do that for you. Ma'am, isn't it true that you were the person that used the word old-fashioned during our interview, correct? Right, but I don't know that you understand what I mean by it. Isn't it true, yes or no, that you were the person that used the term old-fashioned, correct? Yes. And isn't it true that during that time when you used that phrase old-fashioned, you indicated that you were inhibited in your questioning of the defendant? I said I hadn't asked her if she used KY or not. Or Do you who wanna... brought it, if, if that's what you're asking me. I did not specifically ask, did you bring KY or did you bring Astroglide? I did not do that. I'm sorry, but Astroglide to me sounds like a company that lays artificial grass. I thought it was some sort of skateboard. Yeah, it sounds a bit cosmic, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, yeah. But apparently it's a lubricant. <laughs> Ma'am, isn't it true that that's not even the, well, do, why don't we play it so that you can take a look at it, listen to it, okay? Objection, objection. Hey, Lord, Hey, Ma'am, one of the things that you indicated was that there was this issue about Astroglide or KY. Do you remember your, your response just now? Yes. Ma'am, isn't it true that when we were talking about this being old-fashioned, we weren't talking about that. We were talking about something else. And the answer is yes or no. Do you remember? May we approach? I, I can't do it without speaking. Yes, may One looks fed up. Well, can you blame him? Not really. I mean, he's doing everything he can here. Um, she keeps interrupting with, you know, objections. Because she doesn't like the questions being asked. Yeah, obfuscation. And she knows that... Um, the case that she has prepared with Nermi and Samuels in this absolute... Well, she's a monster as well, as far as I'm concerned, Alice. Yeah. is just falling apart. You may continue. And you indicated that 
in, in conjunction with our conversation involving being old fashioned, something about KY and Astro Black. You, you said something about that, right? Yes. Isn't it true that we were actually talking about something else? Do you remember, yes or no, that we were talking about something else? No, I don't remember. And isn't it true that we were talking about anal sex? Do you remember that now? We were talking about anal sex. No, I'm asking whether or not you remember talking about anal sex in conjunction with the fact that you were old fashioned. I don't remember. I don't remember putting those together. I remember we talked about anal sex. All right, well, let, let me go ahead and play the tape for you, and maybe that will refresh your recollection, okay? I see that there's a transcript. I'm just yes, you may. Yes. We are going to take one. This will only take a, a approximately okay. a minute, then we'll move on to sure. another area. She said they had normal sex, and that, um, and this is once again, I, I can't recall if it was Bobby Wise or, or Mr. McCartney that they attempted anal sex once, but that it was, you know, uh, they didn't like it. She didn't like it. This attempt at anal sex, whether it was consummated, did you say it was consummated or not? I didn't ask if it was consummated. And if anal sex was it at her insistence or his request, whether it's Mr. Juanes or Mr. McCartney? I didn't ask. Um, why not? Oh, maybe I'm just old fashioned. I don't know. I, I just, I didn't ask because she said she didn't like it. Can you imagine what Juan was thinking to himself when he heard that when he was interviewing her? <laughs> he must have had a Try and keep in a straight face. Yeah. I mean, where the bloody hell did they ship this one in from? You God know. knows. That was your voice on the tape, correct? Correct. And that's us talking about anal sex, right? Correct. Like you do. And that refreshes your recollection as to it, correct? Correct. Time. Please be back in the designated area at 1.30. 1.30. Please remember the admonition. Have a nice lunch. You are excused. You may step down. You may step down. We need Miss Arias back at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Several plates of green beans laid there. Heard the record will show the presence. Of uh, the defendant and all counsel, the jury is not present. We are completing the hearing we began this morning. The witness has had an opportunity to review Exhibit 604. Ms. Wilmot, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Lamila, you had a chance to review the interview between uh, Detective Flores and Bill Arias? Yes, I did. And were you able to view the entire interview? I, uh, yes, I did. And specifically, you were asked questions earlier by the prosecutor about a nine-second clip of that interview. Did you, did, were you able to put that nine-second clip into context? Yes, I was. And putting that into context, did you, uh, do you see that right prior to that, that, he, that the interview, uh, Mr. Arias is talking about uh, Jody as a teenager? Yes. And that Jody was uh, in trouble with her parents? Yes. Facts that I don't think one disputed. No, I don't think it disputed that. Not at all. Because she had marijuana? Yes. And because she was in trouble, did they search her room? Yes. And that after that, as Mr. Arias describing after that, he, that they searched her room, that Jody felt like they were nosy parents? Yes. And after that, she, she hid things from them, didn't talk to them? Absolutely. And... And then, after all of this context we talk about, after that is where we hear the nine-second clip about uh, since, since she started not talking to them as much, that she basically, the nine-second clip that she lied to them since then, and she was about 14 then. Yes. Uh, putting that in context, 
with what Mr. Arias was talking about as um, Jody as a teenager, does this, does this make any difference to you in your ultimate assessment of domestic violence? No, it doesn't. Does it, something that she did as a 14-year-old girl, uh, as a teenager with her parents, does that have anything to do with the, or change any of the evidence that you've seen with regard to her truthfulness when you're assessing a relationship between Ms. Arias and Mr. Alexander? No, it doesn't. Which isn't the point that he was trying to make. He's been trying to make the point that Jody has been like this for a very, very long time. Yeah, so I don't know exactly what Wil what Wilmot is trying to do here. Well, both of these women believe that Jodie can be manipulative and then not be manipulative for X number of years and then suddenly be manipulative again, and that's just bollocks. Once you're manipulative, you always are. Yeah, exactly. Does it either help or hurt your assessment? It neither hurts or helps my assessment. Right, thank you. Is anything else? Just hard to do. Thank you. All right. Irrespective of what Ms. Lyman said, and with due respect to her position, this appears to be a case where there was shoddy work that was done on her behalf. And one of the aspects of that shoddy work that she did is in taking the defendant's word in this case about the events. There was only one person that she talked to, the defendant, and that was for 44 hours. Uh, gauging or in looking at that statement provided to her by the defendant, this person made the assessment that she was telling the truth. Anything that goes to whether or not the defendant was telling the truth is relevant. I understand that she says that it didn't factor into her assessment, but that's not the inquiry. The inquiry is whether or not there is something out there that may be considered or may cast doubt upon her opinion. Certainly the fact that we have um, evidence already that at that time, at around the age of 14, the defendant saw herself as a victim and never was the victim of abuse, according to the evidence that you just received. It's about that same time that this defendant then begins to be dishonest with her father. And it's even though this witness here says it, it didn't affect my opinion, that may be so. That may, that may be legitimately what she believes, but her opinion is flawed. And it's flawed because she took the defendant's statements into account without really filtering them adequately for the truth, and so I believe that it is relevant and should come in. Your Honor, this, this, absolute, this nine second clip absolutely is not relevant, and in fact it's overly prejudicial under 414-2043. The reason being is, first of all, the state is continually trying to characterize or mischaracterize Ms. LaViolette's testimony by claiming that she only took into account Ms. Arias' uh, words during her interviews. Which she did. She swallowed everything that Jody told her and believed it as the absolute gospel truth. Yeah, she didn't take into account anything else. She didn't no. speak to anybody else. She didn't look at anything else. She just believed in what Jody told her. As she likes to say so often, she didn't feel it was relevant or she didn't feel it was important. Now, Wilmot is going to try and walk this back, say, no, oh, no, that's not the case. She, 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 you know... She's she, been diligent, she's been, you know, she, she's been very, very thorough in her research, but she hasn't. Well, I think one knows that. She did a shit job, and the whole courtroom and the whole of America at that stage knew it. Of course they did. That is not the case, and I don't know how often Miss LaViolette can say it, that it, it's going to change anything, because she keeps continuing to tell the prosecutor that not only did she take into account what Miss Arias told her, she took into account multiple levels of information, including Mr. Alexander's own words. She also talks about the fact that there is no evidence at the time that she's assessing this domestic violence abusive relationship, there is no evidence that Miss Arias was being deceitful in any way. In fact, she's talked about the only person who's deceitful has been Mr. Alexander during this time. So and the second thing is that the state talks about, um, continues to mischaracterize the evidence that Miss Arias was not a victim of abuse. 
There is no such evidence. In fact, the evidence is quite contrary to that, that she was a victim of abuse as a child. So that state should be precluded from continuing to say that as though it's true, because it's not. The um, fact that there is something, this one tiny little piece of information from her father, a father who quite frankly has a motive to not be truthful because he's the one who is abusive. Oh, so... It's not just Jody throwing him under the bus now, it's it, his lawyer. Yeah, can you believe that? How low can these people sink? How they, low can they sink? That's, well, they must be sinking low to believe Jody anyway. And I bet you, once Wilmot has said that, Jody just sits there impassive like she is right there now. Of course it, she those, is. Those words will not, you know, have, have wounded her in any way. Because, I mean, we don't know whether Jody's telling the truth about being, you know... Vi you know, ha having violence perpetrated on her with the wooden spoon or whatever when she was a kid. I mean, her mum didn't deny it. And I think, you know, every one of us who were of a certain age were disciplined at home, weren't we? I mean, oh, I yeah. bloody certainly was. And every day and then some. But, um, you know, to <laughs> I think if anybody knows Jodie better, it's her father. I think he knows her better than bloody Alice does. Of course. And that's why this should be entered into evidence. I agree. A motive to not paint Miss Arius in a, in a good light because of what he has done to Miss Arius. This tiny little piece of information that we have is not relevant, as you heard, to Miss LaViolette's assessment that she did um, 14 years, started 14 years later. So the fact that a teenager was not truthful with her parents at some point has nothing to do with whether or not her assessment was, is flawed. It doesn't, it doesn't weigh. And the fact is, is the state wants to talk about that there is something out there that could ultimately go to Ms. Arias' credibility. But that's not how the rules work. And the law is, and evidence is weighed, that if there is something that is so long ago in time and so minute in detail, there is nothing to support it other than what um, this nine second clip if it's so minute in detail, that means it's not relevant. And if there is any relevance, it's outweighed by its um, unfair pre uh, by unfair prejudice. Based on that, I'd ask you to conclude it. All right. The objection to Exhibit 604 is sustained. However, the state may inquire about the substance in that clip and whether it would have made a difference to this witness in formulating her opinion. Clarification then as to how the state may inquire so that we, we don't get outside of your ruling. What is, what, is, what is, you're saying that the state may not get into the details, but what is the state allowed to ask then? Well, the state is allowed to ask uh, if she has viewed this clip and she's aware of the statement made by the defendant's father and if it would have affected her opinion. So nothing about what the statement of the father was? Yes. Okay. No, he may inquire about the statement of the father, but just not the circumstances that she opined, or that the father opined about the defendant's truthfulness and whether that would have affected her opinion. So he's allowed, okay, so the state's allowed to ask about, about the father making a statement as to Ms. Arias' truthfulness? Yes, but not the circumstances. Well. She's desperate, isn't she? She's desperately trying to not get this censored. <sighs> The problem I see with that judge is that then it, it makes it sound like it's more important than it is. If he's as if the state's allowed to talk about her own father talking about her truthfulness because it's a tr truthfulness as a teenager. It's similar to the restrictions that were placed on this witness with regard to other information she considered in forming her opinion. If you're going, if you're not going to object to the prosecutor putting in the tape or having her explain it then that can happen. But I believe that the state is entitled to question the witness about this aspect in light of her prior testimony regarding what she considered important in forming her opinion about the defendant's truthfulness or credibility. Okay, I, I'm not asking for details, but what I would ask is that it just be qualified so that it's an accurate statement that the father made, her father made a comment about her truthfulness as a teenager. Christ. She doesn't know when she's ahead 
the judge has already ruled in her favour and now she's arguing the toss with the judge. For Christ's sake, Jenny, sit down and count your fucking blessings. Yeah, I think she's been watching Demi Moore too much. <sighs> Arsehole. So that is appropriate From the state, what do you intend to elicit with regard to Exhibit 604? I would like to ask... Oh, hold on. Go ahead. If she has reviewed this clip that this clip indicates or involves the father and that the father uh, has questions as to whether, as to the defendant's truthfulness uh, and that this statement involves the defendant at the age of 14. That's fine, Judge. Okay, let's bring in the jury. Oh, so that's okay with you now, is it, Jenny? Oh, that's fine. So, so can justice proceed now that you're happy? Cow. Please stand for the jury. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez, you may continue. Ma'am, uh, you've had a chance to review a statement by uh, the defendant's father to Detective Flores, correct? Correct. And specifically, you have had a chance to review a portion of that statement involving the father's um, characterization of his daughter in truth of her, in terms of her truthfulness, correct? Correct. And he, and there is an issue with regard to her truthfulness with regard to the father, correct? Involving the defendant. Correct. And this issue that he has with her truthfulness is referenced with regard to the age of 14, correct? And onward. Correct. The issue that we discussed previously involving the defendant being a victim uh, of a, portraying herself as a victim even though there was no abuse, isn't Objection it? Objection is mischaracterizing the evidence. Approach, please. Ma'am, in Exhibit 609, we talked about an interview with Zaina Carranzo, right? Correct. And she's the one that talks about whether or not the defendant likes to play the victim, right? Correct. And one of the things that you told us about this particular incident was that this was when they were teenagers that she was referencing this, correct? It was actually when she was younger than that. Well, you indicated previously when you testified that they were teenagers, yes or no? I thought they were teenagers. I was incorrect. Well, ma'am, isn't it true that that's what you told us previously? That's all yes. I meant. Yes, it is true. And so this indication that you gave previously that they were teenagers is about the same time that the father made the statement about his daughter's lack of truthfulness, correct? Objection, foundation, knowledge. Overruled. Right? I gave the wrong age, Mr. Martinez. I'm not asking you that, am I? Well, you're asking me to put those two things together, Mr. Martinez. Isn't it true that previously, before the break, and whatever it is that you did during the break, you took... Sustained. Previous to the break, you testified that this incident involving Zena Carranzo occurred when they were teenagers, yes or no? Yes, I did testify to that. And isn't it true that the father's statement about the lack of truthfulness references the, the age of 14, correct? Yes, but I... I understand that, thank you. Now, ma'am, with regard to um, certain things, you also, you told us with regard to the... Did you see her face then? Oh, yes. She is starting to get rattled. She is starting to get pissed off. Well, the story is starting to come unfolded. Yeah, and all her faults and every single bit of hard work she did up until this point, it's now starting to come down like the inevitable house of cards. Exactly. Interview that um, you did go back and you did talk to the defendant about certain things, right? Specifically the anal sex, right? I talked to her about the lubricant. No, but my question is, do you remember that we played the clip? And yes. the clip involved anal sex, right? Right. And you told us before the break, well, I went back and I talked to her about the anal sex, right? I talked to her about the anal sex. And so you did go back then and you talked to her sometime afterwards, right? Specifically about the lubricant. When you say specifically of the about the lubricant, you didn't talk to her about the anal sex then? I, I talked to her about who brought the lubricant, as you asked me in our interview, who brought the 
that you thought was important, so I went back and asked her about who brought the lubricant for the anal sex. I, I'm, I'm not interested in who brought the lubricant right now. Oh, I'm interested in your knowledge about the defendant's uh, dalliance or uh, activities in anal sex. That's what I'm interested in. All right. With regard to that particular activity, did you go back and address that issue with the defendant to get the specifics about that? Or did your prejudices prevent you from doing that? Objection argumentative. Sustained. Well, you said that you were old fashioned, right? Yes. And did the fact, or was the fact that you were old fashioned, prevent you from going back and talking to the defendant about the various instances of anal sex? With whom? With whomever she was having anal sex. Jesus, does it matter with whom? That's not what he asked. No. There were different people that she tried. She tried anal sex. She didn't like it. Bullshit. Now I've got you in my sights with my hungry ass. <laughs> And so, Mr. My, Alexander, as far as I know, is the only person that she had repeated <coughs> anal sex with. But my question to you is, did you go back and talk to her about her activities involving anal sex, yes or no? I, I asked her about anal sex. Yes or no? Yes, I asked her about so anal sex. So you went sex. back, and after you went back to talk to her about anal sex, did you... Talk to her about the anal sex involving all these other individuals, or did you just talk to her about anal sex involving Mr. Alexander? Her, I talked to her about anal sex with other people. And I bet Jody's lost count. With regard to those other people, did she ever indicate to you that she had anal sex with Mr. Juarez? I did not talk to her about Mr. Juarez. So, do you know whether or not she had anal sex with Mr. Fadis? No, I do not. Do you know? No, I do not. Would it be important in terms of this, to see who's assertive, to determine who initiated the anal sex, if she in fact had it with Mr. Fadis, would that have been important to you? It's not important in assessing the domestic violence. So the answer violence. is no. It's not as important in assessing domestic violence, which is really what I was asked to do here. So the answer is no. The answer is no, correct? It would be irrelevant. She's a fine one to talk about irrelevance. Right. And with regard to Mr. McCartney, do you know whether or not she had anal sex with Mr. McCartney? She said... She said... She said that, that they had attempted anal sex and, and she didn't like it. How about with Mr. Brewer? Did you talk to her about having anal sex with Mr. Brewer? That they were experimented and tried it and it was not something that either one of them pursued, nor did she pursue it with, with Mr. McCartney. Well, I'm guessing she was really mad for some brown action, but he wasn't and that's why they didn't do it. Yeah, I don't think Daryl would have been that type to do that sort of thing. I don't think he's up Jody Street. No, uh, and up Jody Street being the uh, the, the main phrase, <laughs> Brown Street. Yeah. But there was at least two, as far as you know, there were two attempts at it, correct? Is the way, is that what you're telling me? There were attempts. Right, I used the word attempt, so there were yeah. two attempts, correct? Mm -hmm. And they never went anywhere, I guess, is, is the point. In other words, they, it wasn't consummated, for lack of a better term. It wasn't pursued. And they didn't go forward with it, right? They didn't continue having anal sex. Are you saying they only had it once and didn't continue having it? I don't know how many times they had it. That was not relevant. What was relevant was that it was not enjoyable and they did not continue it as a practice. And that illustrates that if there's an area out there to discuss and you don't think it's important, then you won't discuss it, right? If it doesn't feel relevant to the domestic violence aspect of it, 
because I was retained to look at domestic violence. That's what I did, Mr. Martinez. I looked at domestic violence. Yeah, you looked at my arse, Alice. Yeah, she didn't look at much at all. Not at all. I mean, her research was shoddy. Her interviews were, well, it was just one person. Yeah, Joda. She's a disgrace to her profession and she's a disgrace to every single genuine, you know, domestic violence counsellor and expert that is walking the streets out there trying to stop genuine instances of this happening, isn't it? Yeah, but I don't think she's going to be at a career for much longer. Well, she's still doing it, um, but I don't think that she enjoys the prestige that she used to. Um, and if anyone trusts her with anything, then they're just bloody idiots as I far as I'm I don't think any, a lot of people will trust her after this. I'll tell you something. If you got up and kicked this shit out of me now, right, yeah. and left me for dead, she's the last person I'd consider, you know, calling for counselling or for evaluation or for anything like that. I'd ask she's for, a disgrace. I'd ask for me money back. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> if, if she quoted me, I'd go, what? Bugger off. <laughs> So if it doesn't feel relevant, then it's a feeling that you have about whether or not it's relevant. And if it doesn't feel relevant, then you don't pursue it, right? If it isn't relevant, I don't pursue it. You use the word feel. Do you remember just using that? If it isn't relevant, I don't pursue it. And the person who makes the determination, the gatekeeper about whether or not it's relevant, is you, right? In my... In my assessment of domestic violence, I would be the person. Right. It would be in what you, in your mind, believe is important, right? What me and my experience believe is important. Sure. You, your mind, your experience believe is important, correct? Correct. It could be that others may disagree with you about what is or isn't important, right? Yes. Speculation. Correct? It could, sure. And it could also be that you may be mistaken as to what you think is important or not important, correct? Objection, speculation. Wrong. Anybody can be wrong. I'm not asking about anybody. I'm asking about you. Anybody can be wrong. How about you? Is that a yes? I'm sure I could be wrong. Well, we could give you a quick news flash on that, Alice, but you know yourself you're talking shit. And so in this particular case, it could be that with regard to this aspect of the anal sex and who she had it with and how it was, it was initiated, it could be that you could be wrong about its importance, correct? I don't believe I am. I know you don't believe that you are, but it could be, correct? Objection, speculation. Of the world. Hypothetically, anything could be true, Mr. Martinez. But you're saying in this case it isn't, right? I'm saying I don't believe that it is. One of the other aspects that um, we discussed, or that you believe, is that there, you are aware of the telephone uh, conversation involving the defendant and Mr. Alexander, where they are involved in sex. Yes. Oh, I am Hardy Call. Yeah, the call where... Well, they weren't really having sex. Travis was impersonating Stan Laurel. <laughs> and you indicated that you listened to that, correct? Yes. Did you listen to it before or after my interview with you? I don't remember. But you listened to it, and um, it's your impression that that was tape recorded by Mr. Alexander, correct? Uh, I believe it was tape recorded by Miss Arias. Do you remember that you and I had a conversation about that, this interview back on, in November of 2000 and I'll give you the exact date. 2004, November, November 14th 14. of 2012. Do you remember that we had a conversation about that on November 14th of 2012? Yes. And during that time we discussed who, your understanding of who had taped that conversation, right? Yes. Do you remember that you gave me a different answer? You've got the paper there. Yes I've or no? The... I'm asking what you remember, ma'am. Do you remember giving... I don't remember. I don't remember. So the answer is you don't remember giving me a different answer. I don't remember giving you a different answer, but I believe that what you've got on that paper is correct, and I could have, because I didn't know everything when I had that interview with you. 
You don't know anything now, love. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> She really wants to blame him for everything. She even wants to blame him for recording the phone call when, you know, one quick word with Nermi or Wilmot or even Jody could have put her right on that. But, exactly. But no, Travis is evil as far as she's concerned. Because he's a man. Yes. Ma'am, you had already formed an opinion when I interviewed you back in November 14th of 2012, right? I, f I formed a partial no, do you remember that we discussed it and you said that you already had an opinion? Do you I had an opinion you? about domestic violence, and yes, I did. And in fact, you, do you know what date this trial started? Objection, relevance, argument, it is. Oh, Do you know? What date this trial started? Right. It started at the beginning of this year. No, didn't jury selection, do you know? Well, that jury selection started in December. Of what year? Last year. What year? Give us, is it 2012? 2012. Right. And in December, barely a month before this trial was to start, you and I discussed your opinion, didn't we? In November. Yes, about a month before this trial was to start, right? Yes. And during that time, you gave me all the information that you had at that point, didn't you? Exactly. So what you're saying is you had already done all of this work, you already had reached your opinion, and yet you then went and did some other work? I did some other work. Why is it that when you spoke to me, you already had the uh, impression, or not the impression, the opinion that the defendant was a victim of domestic violence? Because I had read numerous, what, in the paper, and I'm not sure which is the I am and which is the text. I had, had read re I had read a lot of written material. There's a storm coming there, can you feel it? Yes, and I can smell it. Me too. I had looked at a lot of the collateral. I'd read, read the collateral data, and I believed I had enough information, but I hadn't read everything. I, I think I hadn't read some of the text messages or something. I hadn't read everything. But if you already had an opinion, then what's the purpose of going to continue doing an assessment in this case after the if, after you and the prosecutor had an interview, because the more information I can get, the better. And if I find confounding, uh, confounding information, or I find something, but the more information I have, the better to create a better context. So I continue to collect information as long as I can. So are you saying that when you spoke to the prosecutor in November 2012, you were unprepared to give an opinion as to whether or not the defendant uh, suffered from domestic violence in this case? No, I didn't say that. Your opinion was complete when we spoke. You said, isn't it true, that in your opinion, the defendant was the victim of domestic violence, right? Correct. And you had reviewed whatever it was that you had reviewed up to that time, right? Correct. And you had looked at all of the corroboration that you that was that you had taken a look at, right? Correct. And based on all of that, you and I had this discussion, right? Yes, we did. And it's an absolute opinion that you had. In other words, you weren't waffling when you spoke to the prosecutor about this. You were certain of your opinion back in November 2012, right? Yes, I was. If you're already certain about your opinion when you're talking to the prosecutor, what's the purpose of going back? Well, let me do, there is no purpose served in going back and doing more work on this case if you already have an opinion, is there? There is to me. How can that possibly be if you've already reached an opinion? You, that's an absolute. the more isn't? information I have, the better off I am. The more information I have, it just keeps being helpful to add information. I do that in all my cases. I don't stop gathering information. But about what she didn't do was share her findings with the prosecution. No, she wouldn't have done that if they were incriminating to Jodie. No. Let's talk about the telephone call. That wasn't new information to you at the time that you spoke to the prosecutor in November of 2012, was it? No. You knew about it, right? Correct. And at that time, isn't it true that you told the prosecutor that the person who actually had tape recorded that conversation was Mr. Alexander? Do you remember telling 
that I thought it was. Well, everything can be prefaced with I think. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, bloody hell. What's up? I think of contracting myxomatosis. <laughs> I don't have... I don't have a historical record much like you have right there to refer to. I made some verbal mistakes I'm, in my interview with you, and I am more than willing to say that. I'm more I'm not, than willing to say that I misspoke. It is not information I got from Ms. Arias. I looked at it later because of our interview. And what you're saying when you're saying that you made mistakes is that you were not paying attention to detail in this case because you were already in the defendant's camp. It didn't matter to you to pay attention to this stuff. Objection, argumentative. Did it matter to you to pay attention to this stuff and be precise about it at that point? What mattered to me, Mr. Martinez? Yes or no? What mattered was context, Mr. Martinez. Yes or the no? big picture mattered to me, Mr. Martinez. The big picture. All of the evidence. Does the date matter to me? Not as much as what Objection happened. Objection, not responsive. I'm asking you about a telephone call. I'm not asking you about the date of the telephone call, am I? No, you're not. I'm asking about your knowledge as to who recorded it, right? And I have answered that. You've answered it, but you've also said that you made a mistake, right? I made a mistake and who made the recording. Yes, I and did. And if you made a mistake about that, Something that, that in your review of all of this case, isn't it true that that is the only piece of evidence that we have where Mr. Alexander is actually present and you can actually hear what he's saying, right? Where I can actually hear his voice? Yes. Yes. And you're the person that told us that in terms of the clinical interview and people talking, 90% is body language, right? You told us that previously, right? Right. If we can't get the body language, at least you can get the inflections from that telephone call, can't you? Yes. That's better than looking at a text message where you claim that Mr. Alexander may have been mistaken when he wrote down a name, right? There are lots of text messages. Ma'am, we discussed a text message yesterday. Do you remember that? In which yes. you indicated that you thought that Mr. Alexander had written the wrong name. Do you remember that? Yes. So this telephone call is much better evidence, if you will, because you can see the, or hear the interaction between the two of them, right? That doesn't necessarily make it better. It makes it different. There is a huge difference between hearing someone say something and seeing it written down. Yeah, because you can't really tell what the person's thinking when it's just written down. Yeah. You don't know what emotions they're going through. You don't know what they're feeling. Whereas if you hear their voice and they're talking about it, you can hear every single li little bit of emotion, detail, um, cadence, whatever. Yeah, but I don't think she was looking for that. It's not just different, as she said. It's a completely different ball game. It's... It's more identifiable yeah. than being written down. I mean, I could, I could write down to you, I hate you. Well, that doesn't mean I hate you. It just probably means a, a, it means a affectionate I hate you. You know, like if you do something that I've never been able to do and I just say I hate you for that, you know. Yeah. Could be that. But if I turn around and say I hate you, you know, it doesn't mean I hate you. But if I turned around to you and said, oh, God, I hate you, then that's, that's different. So when you see it written down, you can't differentiate unless the words surrounding it give it context. Yeah. So she is full of shit as usual. But it doesn't necessarily make it better. So you would rather have a written document than a recorded conversation is what you're saying. I'm saying that a recorded sex tape does not necessarily have to be accurate, any more accurate, but when you look at a compilation, a lot of text messages, a lot of IMs, a lot of Gmails, that you get a lot more information. I'm not denying that it was important to hear his voice and to hear the exchange. 
And in terms of the comparative analysis between that exchange between the defendant and Mr. Alexander, the person she ultimately killed, you're saying that that information there is as good or maybe less than as good as something in writing? Overall, you may answer. Can you repeat the question? Which is better, this tape-recorded conversation or a text message? Which one? Which one? I can't say which is better. In your assessment in this case, you can't say which one is better, right? I'm saying that there's a, there's a large number of text messages. There's a large number of IMs. There is one sex tape that I listen to. So if you ask me to weigh and ask me what's more important, I'd have to say they're important, but I have to take all of that information in. Right, I can't remember how long the sex tape was. We covered it, didn't we? Yeah, we did. But it was pretty long. From what Travis was saying and the way he was saying it, she could, you know, she could get a lot out of that. She could get a lot of, you know, background out of that. But yeah, she didn't. But she didn't care about what Travis was going through. Nope. She only cared about what Jody was going through. She made a conscious decision, I believe, when she took this case, to only see it from one side. Exactly. She didn't. It didn't even occur to her, in my opinion, to think, well, maybe this woman that I've been paid to represent, maybe she's a wrong one. No, nope. didn't even enter her head. I don't think. It didn't even co come. Come into conversation, probably. Well, I reckon the first couple of hours she spent with Jody. Jody is very highly charismatic. She is. And I'm sure during those first couple of hours, like we said earlier, hook, line and sinker. And yeah, Alice just fell for it. But she's very manipulative as well. And do you know what's so sad about what? this? Do you remember when she first started testifying and she was telling us about, you know, her credentials and about what she's done to help people? Yeah. I felt something close to admiration for her because, you know, from what she was saying, from what she'd, she'd stated, she'd done some brilliant work and she'd done some sterling work to help, you know, victims of domestic abuse. Yeah. And I thought, well, how could people think that this woman is, you know, bad. so bad? But we gave her the benefit of the doubt. We did. I mean, we're slagging her off now because she deserves it, but I just want it to be noted and, and, you know, for everyone to know that we gave her the benefit of the doubt and we gave her a fair crack of the whip and she's the one who shit in the punch as far as we're concerned. Exactly, yeah. she is. And that's how you approach this case, where you have something that's as vital as Mr. Alexander talking. When you have Mr. Alexander talking, you can hear in, in the tone of his voice whether he's happy or unhappy, can't you? Whether he's happy or unhappy? Right. You can hear what he presents, certainly. Well, it's what he presents, but you're, one of the things that you did is you talked to the defendant and she presented that evidence to you by talking to you, right? Correct. So now, when Mr. Alexander is talking, he's presenting to you. He doesn't know it, but he's presenting to you, right? Yes, he is. And that's even better than what the defendant is presenting to you because he doesn't have the issue of secondary gain there, does he? It depends on how you look at it. Well, no, I'm asking about your definition of secondary gain. Do you remember we talked about that previously? Secondary gain? I certainly do. That if it's within the individual's uh, point of view that something is going to be beneficial to them, then there's this issue that they may be deceitful, right? There's secondary gain in a sex tape. I'm not asking you about that right now. We're talking to you about secondary gain, just itself, correct? Well, and secondary gain, secondary gain is not only part of whether somebody is going to get something from an expert witness or an attorney. Secondary gain also implies um, what you're going to get when you're having a sexual encounter with somebody. So, so there's. So you're equating in this case. An individual who is charged with a very serious crime with somebody who may be, may be talking about masturbation, you're equating that and saying, well, they both have the same reason 
I to be not, deceitful. I did not say that. Well, that's what you indicated. Are you saying that Mr. Alexander, when he was speaking with the defendant, was in the same relationship as you were with the defendant when you were speaking to her? If you were in my group, I would ask you to take a time out, Mr. Martinez. But he's not in one of your groups right now, Alice. He is a prosecutor in a criminal murder trial, and you are a witness for the defence, and you are defending a monster. So don't try and quantify your groups to this court courtroom, because it just won't wash. No, I mean, you should treat him with the respect he deserves. Exactly. He, he is, was actually there. He was there. He has a, he ha, has a lot invested in this because he was at the crime scene. She bloody wasn't. She just flicked through a few photos and thought, oh, well, that doesn't make any difference. I'm sure that my darling Jodie wouldn't have done something so horrible to Travis unless he'd provoked her. Exactly. God. I'll tell you something. If, um, if Jodie is the, the wicked witch of the weird, then Alice is the wicked witch of the wanker. Exactly. Judge, would you please admonish the witness to yes. withhold those comments and ask that Ms. the jury LaViolette. disregard the outburst? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, disregard the witness's last statement. Ms. LaViolette, please just answer the questions. Did you see the look on her face when the judge ruled? Yeah. She did not like that. Proper slap to us. Isn't it true, ma'am, that the relationship between you and Mr. and Ms. Arias when you were asking the questions and you were talking to her is different than the relationship between Mr. Alexander and the defendant when they were having this telephone conversation back on May 10th of 2008. Yes, it is. They were being intimate in that conversation, weren't they? They were being sexual. I don't know how intimate they were being. They were being tender to each other, weren't they? There was a tenderness. And there was a feeling, if you will, that they were getting along there, correct? Correct. There was no indication from the tape itself that Miss Arias wasn't enjoying herself as much as Mr. Alexander, right? No, there was no indication. They were both enjoying each other carnally if only connected through wireless space, correct? I can't speak to how much someone was enjoying it on a sex tape. Well, particularly I, a female. I'm not asking about do you for you to quantify it. There is there are indications there that Miss Arias is having an, an orgasm on two occasions, right? Correct. So she has an orgasm on two occasions and he has an orgasm on one occasion, right? Yes. And that was faked as well, wasn't it from her? Of course it was, you could tell. I've got no doubt it's probably clean up time in Travis's house, but for her, yeah, she was definitely faking it. Of course she was. So, um, based on that, it is clear that they're enjoying each other, correct? Objection, speculation. Overruled. Have you seen when Harry met Sally? Oh, shut it, Alice. I'm not asking you about that, ma'am. I'm asking you whether or not they're enjoying themselves. I can't tell whether she's having an orgasm or not. So that I can tell that, that she's... So that means then you can't tell if he's having an orgasm either, right? No. So you're saying that, as you said here, it's, they may have had an orgasm or they may not have had an orgasm, right? They were at least acting like they had an orgasm. Both of them were acting, right? Yes. They were, they were acting as they had an orgasm. I don't know what they had. But there's really no indication from any collateral source that, for example, the defendant was not having an orgasm. You don't have any information from any other source that says she wasn't, right? No, I don't. You don't have any information from any other collateral source that says he wasn't having an orgasm, right? No. So why is it that you are now choosing to interpose a belief that, for example, Mr. Alexander was not having an orgasm if there is nothing out there to support that. Objection, argumentative. Sustained. What leads you to believe that Mr. Alexander was not having an orgasm? You know, once again, my expertise is in domestic violence, not in orgasms. Why? Are you still a virgin? Then and why did you answer the question you, the way you did if you're not an expert in orgasms? Because you ask me questions so quickly and I really should stand back and think about them because those questions are not within the sphere 
of what I actually was retained to do, which was assess domestic violence. Or it could be that, as you sit out there, you're advocating on behalf of the defendant, and you're only presenting things that benefit her. Objection. <coughs> Correct? I, it was, it was. This conversation, where they are both talking, you told me that you believed that it was Mr. Alexander that tape recorded it, correct? Correct. And that's because of your biases and because you were, if you will, in favor of the defendant, that would seem more appropriate to you, correct? No, I just misspoke. So that's the second so-called expert in this trial that has misspoke. Again. Samuels first, and now bunny teeth here. <laughs> you just misspoke, but you had no basis for misspeaking, correct? Probably, I did not. You could have properly said, I don't know, correct? Yes, I could have. And, but instead, you chose to cast aspersions, if you will, on Mr. Alexander. Objection uh, the evidence just because he... You may answer. I didn't believe that was casting aspersions. I believed that... I didn't, be, I didn't believe whoever taped it was a problem. I believed that they were both participating. So I didn't think that was problematic that he would... Just, whether he did it or whether she did it. Just it's, like the text message before that we discussed that involved the names of those two women. Do you remember that, that we discussed that yesterday? Yes. Rather than saying, well, it could be that the defendant lied to Mr. Alexander, you immediately went to the fallback position that Mr. Alexander perhaps typed the wrong name. Do you remember telling me that yesterday? Yes. Every time that there's been a judgment call in this case, you have taken the defendant's side, correct? I'm not sure that I have. I am hoping and praying now that Wang gives her multiple examples, because there are multiple examples. Oh, there are hundreds. Yeah. Well, on those two occasions you did, right? On two occasions I did. And I, and I don't think of it as taking someone's side, because I don't think that who taped the thing was, was a critical issue. I didn't think it cast aspersions on either Mr. Alexander or Miss Arias. I just thought they consensually did a, a sex tape and that that wasn't a really important aspect. Do you believe her? No. I mean, what the hell does she, you know, consider vital? I don't believe her for one second. Maybe, as I said before, at the beginning of this trial, you know, what she might have said could have been considered plausible, but now... No. It's just getting ridiculous. Yeah. And the bias is just too plain to say. Exactly. As, as to who, who did it. And I probably just should have said I don't know. Well, you had had information previous to that that the, that the defendant really only had sex with Mr. Alexander to please him. You've had that information, didn't you? No. That you never heard that the defendant felt uncomfortable when she was engaging in sex with Mr. Alexander? And I also heard that she I felt comfortable. Foundation when sustained. As part of your investigation in this case, did you review several sexual encounters involving the defendant and Mr. Alexander? Yes. And with regard to the first sexual encounter, what is your understanding of the first sexual encounter? What kind of sex act was involved? It was oral sex, and she was uncomfortable with it being too soon. Ma'am, so it was oral sex and she was uncomfortable with it being too soon. Where did this oral sex take place? The oral sex took place um, in the, the home of the Hughes. And that's the first time that they ever had this oral sex, right? That's, yes. With regard to this oral sex, you said, well, she felt uncomfortable, right? Yes. So if we then listen to the tape, was there any indication there that she was uncomfortable with any of the phrases that were being used? Objection at the foundation when the tape was actually made. Approach, please. 
Overruled, you may continue. Your assessment of the tape, you don't see anything indicating that she, the uh, defendant is uncomfortable in any way, do you? You mean seven months later? No, I mean on May 10th of 2008. So seven, seven, seven months after she said she was uncomfortable? All right, if you want to say seven months after she was uncomfortable, let's go with seven months. Yes, yeah, seven months after she was uncomfortable. I don't see discomfort in, in the tape on, of 510, if that's what you're asking. And, and ma'am, just for the purposes of the math here, if that happened in May of 2008, would you agree then that uh, seven months before that would be November of 2007, correct? Correct. And oh, no, no, I'm sorry. November, so, so, so that was November of uh, 2006 when they first had the sexual encounter, so it's quite a bit prior to that. Part of the reason that I point that out is that it appears that you seem to jump to um, a conclusion when, when you're answering these questions, and, and, and in, like in this case, you were mistaken. Wouldn't you agree? Objection recommended. Overruled. That I gave the wrong date, the seven months? You were, you were mistaken, weren't you? Yes, and I remembered quickly that it was November 6th. No, you didn't remember quickly. Actually, the prosecutor prompted you, correct? Objection relevance argumented. Overruled. Isn't that how it worked? I didn't feel prompted by you, but uh, okay, if you want to prompt well, me, no. that's fine. Didn't the prosecutor indicate to you May 2008, and just for purposes of clarification, he then indicated it was November 2007. Do you remember that? Exchange? And just then, now? Yes, and then I yes said... Yes or no? Then, yes or no? I said... Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Go one. <laughs> yeah. Now, ma'am, one of the other things about the interview that you had with the defendant is that you had these issues with regard to what she told you, but you also prompted her with leading questions, didn't you? I don't believe I did. You, prompt, you suggested some answers, didn't you? Are you talking about objection overall? Do you may answer yes or no? I, I don't. I mean, I interviewed her over 44 hours, so I'm not sure. I try very difficult or very hard not to lead people. Well, do you remember that? With regard to her, one of the things involving sex was that you had an issue or a question as to whether or not the defendant or, or Mr. or the defendant, yes, isn't it true that you wanted to know from Ms. Al, from Ms. Arias whether or not she used sex to quell his anger? That is your question, right? Yes. And those are your words, right? Yes, but I think she had already mentioned that to me. And well, I was just... if she had already mentioned it to you, then why did you feel the need to ask her about it? Oh, yeah, again. Sorry, that just came out. I just pressed record mid there. She, yeah, completely. Completely got her again. Got her again. Yeah. Catch 22, <laughs> checkmate. You know, that was a long time ago. I, well, then I, don't, maybe we I can... don't know. I, well, then... I really don't know. I can't tell you. Let's take a look at your notes about what you wanted okay. to ask her. All right. Objection, judge. Uh, overruled. Take a look at Exhibit 612. I'm sorry, but am I the only one who finds those glasses incredibly creepy? They are a bit creepy. I mean, they just don't look right on her. They don't. And she looks creepy in them. She does. She looks like, you know, your worst nightmare. You know, a bloody old granny coming after you in, in your nightmares. Yeah, someone you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley. No. You recognize the writing there? Sure. That's your writing, correct? Yes, it is. And um, at the top of the page, it, it indicates, ask Jody, right? Yes. These are the questions that you wanted to ask her, correct? Correct. 
And in fact, there are more than one or two questions there, correct? Yes, yes sir. And, and none of these questions, if you will, have a question mark after them, do they? No, I, I guess not. Well, no, let's just take a look at the first one and read that. And, well, just read the whole document to see there are no question marks there. No, there aren't any question marks. But you do say that you want to ask Jody about this, correct? Correct. This is part of your investigation into this case, right? Yes. And one of the things that you wanted to ask Jody was, did you use sex to quell his anger, right? Yes. So that was your, if you will, question to the defendant, correct? It was my question. Yes. And so you were leading her or suggesting the answer there, weren't you? I didn't feel that I was. I know you don't feel that you were, but isn't it true that you're saying, did you use sex to quell his anger, right? You're speaking specifically about anger in that question, right? It was if. You may. You may continue. Isn't it true that you were suggesting the answer there when you were talking about anger? I was basing it on information that I had gotten from journals and other information. How many times has she given that answer? I based it on the journals, on the text messages, on all the information that I had. It seems to be her go-to stock answer for every single question that Martinez bloody asks her. Yeah, I don't think she's got any other answers to give. No. She's just flying by the seat of her pants like the whole bloody defence. Yeah, well, one's about to snap the string off. And I was putting it together, and I was asking the question because it appeared that that was happening. Yeah. But so the answer so is... So I, I did ask that question. I did yeah, ask yes that question. No, you, you, isn't it true, then, that you did suggest the answer of... Did you use sex to quell his anger? You suggested an answer there, right? I guess I did. And you also ask whether or not distress to Travis means sex, right? I believe that might have been an answer and not and that was an answer to that question, not a um, not a question. Actually, that's not the way it's written. Take a look at um, the way it's written. It said distress to Travis meant sex. I think that is the answer to that question. And at the top of this... Sorry about that, guys. Source video. Page, it also says ask Jody, right? Right, but you... Yes or no? It does say that at the top, right? They weren't all questions. I, I do sort of stream of consciousness, so I don't... I ask Jody questions, I get answers, I might put them on the same page. I just want to clarify that. If I was one by now, I'd have lost my patience with her for simply refusing to answer a yes or no question. Yeah, but also he's also got to act professionally. Yes, he does, but there is a way to lose your patience and still act professional as well. You can lose your patience professionally, yeah, sort I of suppose thing, that's true. without kind of letting your emotions run wild. Yeah. How is it that you are saying that you are putting some other questions on this page, uh, other answers on this page, when they're clearly all questions here. Objection mischaracterizes with her testimony. Oh, you mean. Right under, did you use, did he use, or did you use um, sex to quell his anger? I have an answer, distress to Travis meant, meant sex. That was an answer to that question. So you provided your own answer to the question then. That's what you're saying. No. Oh, do you mean? Right? It was a question I asked Ms. Arias and so I I write on on the papers that I write questions on, I write answers on, I write other things on. So it's not clearly just all questions, it's not clearly just all answers. I intersperse things. Ma'am, isn't it true that at the top of this page it says, ask Jody, correct? Correct. And then there are a number of writings underneath there, right? Correct. You're not saying that as you're sitting there talking to the defendant, you're writing down, ask Jody, are you? No, I'm not. This is something that was done in advance, isn't it? 
The question was, yes. This document was done in advance, wasn't it? Yes. And so when you say that, well, I write the responses, how could the responses be there if you're doing this document in advance? Now that's a conundrum, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, she is actually looking now nervous. Yeah, I think he's just caught her there. I could be wrong. We both could be wrong, couldn't we? Exactly, but I don't think we were. Let's hope not. Let's hope we're right on this, but if we are right, he's caught her in a massive, massive whopping lie there. And wow, she did. this was prepared in advance, the questions and the responses. How can that even be deemed evident, you know, put, put into evidence? The mind boggles and... It, I'm just a bit flabbergasted at the moment. I don't know about you. Let's see what where this goes. Yeah. I wasn't doing all that. Mr. Martinez? Yes or no? Yes or no? Was, isn't it true that all of these questions were written in advance? Judge, the, the original question was not a yes or no question. Or did not request a yes or no answer. All right. Your objection is noted. Overruled. You may answer the question. The question is correct. I Thank wrote... you. Thank you. Now, one of the other things that you told us is that you reviewed all of the, or a lot of the defendant's journals, right? Yes. And that um, these journals, if you will, were guided by this law that she believed in that if you when you write something in there that you should write something positive and not anything negative, correct? That you should try to focus on the positive. Right. And what's that law called again? The law of attraction. So this law of attraction, according to you, uh, the way that... And you've had some information that you received upside and apart from what the defendant gave you, correct? Well, I watched The Secret. That's it. So The Secret is a movie, right? Correct. And in it, it talks about, or it is about the law of attraction, right? Yes, and so there's a documentary, and I don't remember the name of that. But you didn't watch the documentary, correct? No, I watched the documentary as well. Oh, you did. And then you also spoke to the defendant about the law of attraction, correct? Correct. And that is what encompasses your knowledge of the law of attraction, correct? Correct. And the law of attraction, as you've defined it for me, is that if you write something positive, Positive things will happen, correct? No, not, it's not that simple. Go ahead and tell me what you believe the law of attraction is. That that's part of it, that the energy you put out in a positive way comes back to you. So you should think in a positive way, write in a positive way. Um, and this was a, a documentary done by physicists and they were talking about positive energy and all of the energy, you know, the energy coming back to you. And one of the things you just mentioned to us is writing in a positive way, right? Correct. And so, for example, this is what you applied in reading the defendant's journals, that she was influenced by this law of attraction, correct? Correct. And so that, according to you, she wouldn't write anything negative in that journal because it would go against the law of attraction, right? No, I didn't say that. Well, isn't it true that we talked about, or you talked to the defense counsel about situations as to whether or not there was anything negative about Mr. Alexander? Do you remember talking about that? Yes, and there were and, several things yes. that were negative. And you also were asked about certain events that occurred in their life, for example, when she alleges that he hit her? Do you yes. remember that? Yes. And you said, well, because of the law of attraction, it made sense to you that those wouldn't be written in the journal, right? Yes, I, I believe I, I... I don't think that's the only reason, but yes. Oh, we know that wasn't the only reason, Alice. That's part of the reason, and, sure. and uh, it, based on what you know about the Law of Attraction, you would not expect her to write anything negative in her journals because it would be contrary to that Law of Attraction, right? No, I would expect that even when you have a philosophy of the law of attraction, that you're not always able to maintain it. Okay, so in this case, though, with regard to writing negative things, 
you did not find anything in those journals indicating that Mr. Alexander ever laid a finger on the defendant, correct? Objection is characterized as your testimony. Overall, to me, answer. Correct? Correct. But you still believe the defendant, though, right? Based, based on other things. And those things are her statements, right? Those things are Mr. Well, no, 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 let's do this. You believe it in part because of her statements, right? In you part. Come. You also believe it in part because of the law of attraction, attraction right? right? I believe that, that she didn't write in it because of the law of attraction, or I believe that she he was never laid a finger on her. You believe that the reason she didn't write these things in her journal, as you explained it on direct examination, is because, in part, she's an adherent to the law of attraction, correct? Correct. And that's how you tried, or that's how you went behind, if you will, the written word, correct? Objection, the world. I believed that that was a reason she didn't write in her journal. Right, and that's why you went behind the words that indicated otherwise, right? The words never indicated that he ever hit her, correct? Correct. The words never indicated that he ever choked her, correct? Correct. The words never indicated uh, any other physical act towards her, correct? indicated cruel behavior, but I don't acts. know what that was. I, I don't know what that meant. I'm talking about acts. For example, did they cruel never... Cruel behavior would be an act. With regard to that, there was no indication that he ever hit her. Where is your understanding that he hit her on the day that she indicated that she was leaving? I have no indication other than her word. Right, so he's finally got her to admit the truth and admit that she only had her word and believed her. Thank you, Juan. Yeah, you finally, finally got it out of her. <sighs> well, that, that that was a chore and a half, wasn't it? It took him a bleeding while to get it out of her, though. Yeah, just a bit, but thank goodness. And, right, and what did she tell you? On, on the day she was leaving... Wait a minute, on what day that she was leaving? She, remember that you talked about... The uh, Mr. Alexander hitting the defendant on the day that she indicated she was going to move back to Wairika. Correct. Where did he hit her? He hit her on the jaw, on the. F and and that's the and you got that information from the defendant, correct? Correct. Um, do you know somebody by the name of uh, Dan Freeman? Yes. Uh, and you're. Well, I don't know him. I just read a statement. I don't know him. And with regard to Dan Freeman, you know that he's somebody that's a friend to the defendant, right? Correct. And in that story that we're talking about, the one where she tells him she's going to go to Wairika, and there's this, it appears to be a backhand, correct? Correct. Uh, he strikes out and lashes at her because he doesn't want her to leave, correct? Correct. Objection speculation as to Mr. Alexander his reasoning behind hitting. Sustained. We've said it before many times, haven't we? We have. And we'll say it again. When she went to see him or texted him or called him uh, to tell him she was going, you know, moving away from Mesa back to Wairika, he probably partied or danced a jig or did some, <laughs> some celebratory shit, didn't he? Oh, I'm sure he celebrated her leaving. Yeah, partied hard. Um, yeah. Peace of mind. Yeah, thought, thank goodness. Exactly. Well, isn't that what the defendant told you? That Mr. Alexander hit her because she told him that she was going to go to Wairika. And that he was upset about it. Right. That's what she, that's what she told you, right? Correct. Again, my question to Dan Freeman. Uh, do you know whether or not Mr. Freeman had a conversation with Mr. Alexander prior to this incident about whether or not Mr. Alexander wanted Miss Arias to even be around in the Mesa area. I have no information on that. Would it be important to get that side of the story if, hypothetically speaking, Mr. Freeman were to have testified that it was actually Mr. Alexander that, was, that had to have the talk with the defendant about breaking up and leaving? That would be information that I would like to have. 
Let's assume that that's the hypothetical, that Mr. Alexander actually didn't want anything else to do with the defendant, and he's the one that's pushing her away and telling her to leave. Okay. Let's assume that. And assume that it's Mr. Alexander that's telling her that he wants her to leave. Wouldn't that be something that you would want to know in weighing whether or not what the defendant told you is true involving her statement about telling Mr. Alexander that she was going to Wairika? It's important, and I have no evidence to support what you're saying. She also had no evidence that Jodie got hit that day, but chose to believe her anyway. Yeah. The double standard in this is just absolutely astonishing. It's diabolical. Right, but let's assume hypothetically that that evidence does exist out there. I'm asking you to assume the truth of it. Assume well, that you're, that you're asking me to assume a hypothetical that I have no evidence of. Is that correct? And I'm assuming that, and I'm asking you to assume that hypothetical because that person, let's say, came into this court and said that. All right. Assume that. If all of that were true, wouldn't that cause a problem in your assessment of this case? Because now, at least, as to this alleged incident, it doesn't seem to be true. It would be important for me to have that information. You have that information. Now what are you going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? Yes, in terms of your opinion. Does that, Does that give you a sense of pause in the firmness of your opinion? It gives me information that I have to look at, that I have to check out. Does it globally change the picture of domestic violence in regard to the evidence that I have reviewed and seen, it doesn't mean that there was no domestic violence. So what you're saying, your opinion that changes not, even though you have you, that new information were to be provided to you, right? That, that Mr. Alexander wanted Miss Arias to leave? Yes, and go back to Wairika. There's also no evidence of that. I'm not saying that there's no evidence of that. I'm asking you to assume that Daniel Freeman came into this courtroom and said that, that he was there. If you had that, would that give you pause in terms of your opinion? I would. Yes or no? It's not a yes or no question. Okay, Mr. then we'll move on. Now, with regard why is he moving on? Why isn't he pursuing that line of questioning? Why isn't he just trying to filter her down to a yes or no answer, like he has been doing? <laughs> well, maybe with the saying she can't answer yes or no, he just thought, well, forget it, let's bloody move on. I really hope he comes back to this later, because that is something that needs to be explored, isn't it? I think he will, because maybe Wilmot will go over that with her when she takes over and then when it goes back to Martinez. Yeah. His job is to, you know, strengthen the cause of um, justice. Yeah. And they have to have a reasonable doubt. Exactly. He, he has just narrowed that considerably in the last few minutes with what he just did. Well, with the way uh, he rattled her. Yeah. Without geeking out too much and being too much of a fanboy, we are watching a master at work, aren't we? Oh, absolutely, and I'm enjoying it. Yeah. ...to this fight. Do you remember about the tr that you told us about the trip to have a supai? Correct. And you spoke to the defendant about it, right? Correct. And what was her version of the trip to have a supai? Why don't you tell us what you know about the trip to have a supai and tell us who started it, if there was a fight? There was an, an argument. Between whom? Between Miss Arias and Mr. Alexander. Where did it start? I don't know where it started. Uh, do you know how it started? There, I read two things. I read sure. something that, that the Freemans wrote, but I would like to look at uh, the information in well, the I, journal, I, because I got the information from a journal that I read, and uh, the specifics of that information I can tell you the gist of that information. Why don't you give me the gist of that information? The gist of that information was they had a fight, they had an argument. Um, 
In fact, Lisa Andrews said he, he was very negative, that she thought he was overly negative reporting that trip. I'm According asking, to I'm Ms. Just asking, ma'am, I'm just asking about the trip itself. I don't want all this collateral uh, information that you want to provide. Okay. I want to know, for example, who started the fight, what was said during the fight, how long the fight lasted, and whether or not the defendant made any comments about the fight in her journal. That's sort of the information what I'm, that I'm looking at. In the, uh, objection, Judge, he just asked for the gist. If he's going to go into detail, then the witness is requested to be able to review the documents. All right, we're going to take the afternoon recess at this time, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I release you for the afternoon break, <clears throat> the court is considering holding trial on Friday this week, this Friday, April 12, from 9.30 to 12.30. I'm also considering holding trial on April 26, that's a Friday, from 9 to 4, and on May 3rd, from 10 to 4. During the break, please look at your calendar, and when you come back, I'm going to ask you to let me know if any of those dates would cause a problem for you in being present. Marvelous. Yes. Yes. April 12, 9.30 to 12.30. April 26, from 9 to 4. And May 3rd, from 10 to 4. In addition, for your planning purposes, one of the jurors has a conflict this Thursday, so we will be starting trial at 10.30 instead of 9.30. So 10.30 this Thursday. And I know there is a request by another juror for two additional days. We are still discussing that. Any other questions about the schedule at this point? All right, you are excused. Please remember the admonition. Yeah, whisper away, you gibbering shit sack. I wonder if she's really blowing in her ear. Ninety-eight assault charges filed against the seven dwarfs later. Let's bring in the jury. of the jury, the defendant and all counsel, Mr. Martinez, you may continue. Ma'am, I want you to take a look at uh, exhibit number 242.001 and go to the entry dated Thursday, September 13th, 2007. Read it. When you're done reading it, you let me know. September 13th, did you say? I have it tapped for you right there. See it? Let me do it again. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Are you done reading it? Yes, I am. Why don't you just turn it the other way with the finding up and then down. Well, that's all right. Anyway. With regard to that, does that, you, that is something that you read as part of your uh, investigation into this case, right? Correct. And it's something that you remember reading, right? Yes. And it is something that you used in uh, reaching whatever assessment you reached in this particular case, right? Yes. And one of the things that uh, that talks about is a trip to have a supai, right? Correct. And it references a number of people going with them to have a supai, correct? Correct. It's the defendant who goes, one of the people, right? Yes. Uh, one of the other people is Travis Alexander, correct? Yes. Somebody by the name of Daniel Freeman also goes, correct? Yes. And Desiree Freeman, right? Yes. And there's some writing there, and this is written by the defendant, correct? Correct. That's your understanding of it, right? Yes. And these are, this is part of the cor corroboration that you used in reaching your assessment, right? Yes. In other words, this is the collateral source that you found to be for lack of a better term, uh, accurate, uh, so that you could then compare it to what the defendant was saying and to what other people were saying, right? I didn't consider this a collateral source. So it, it's a primary source then, right? 
It's a, it's a source from the, the defendant. So you consider that to be a primary source then, right? No, I look at collaterals as just other people other than the defendant. Not that it's better or worse, but that right. it's and in, this and in this particular entry, the defendant bemoans the fact that things are not starting out, did not start out very well on the trip to have a soup bike, correct? Correct. And um, she indicated there were some tense moments there at the beginning, right? Yes. And then she also indicated that Mr. Alexander apologized, correct? Correct. And she said that, uh, according to her, that he was 90% uh, uh, responsible for the argument, right? Yes. That One he said people, he was. Yeah. Pardon? What did she you say? says that he said he was 90%. Right. Yeah. The, the, not the gist of it. He's saying that he's 90% responsible for the argument, right? Correct. And did you consider talking to Daniel Freeman about that uh, incident to see if it actually corresponded to what's actually in that book? I read the, the Freeman statements, so, but I... So the answer is no, you did not talk to him. Right. I did not talk to him. And, and that being the case, you are left with that rendition there as something that, in your view, since it's a primary source, is something that's truthful, correct? It's something that I took to be truthful, yes. I've been studying his technique, um, and at this stage of the trial, I pretty much kind of know what it is. And he likes to take people apart very slowly, very methodically, and he gives them enough rope to hang themselves with, just as Alice, you know, gave herself loads of slack, didn't she? Oh, she did. Yeah. A lot of it. Yeah. Um, but he has been... I think the Hollywood movies kind of have us expecting things to be tied up in a very neat bow, but real life is rarely like that, as we've said, you know, previously. Yeah, that's true. But I just love the way that he is picking apart... Um, her veneer and showing the jury her bias, her clear bias towards her defendant and, you know, not much interest in the actual truth. Well, no, she's not interested in the truth. If she was, she would have interviewed other people. Well, yeah, not just li listen to one side of the story. At least Daniel and Desiree to get some sort of, you know, idea if they witnessed Travis being violent. The, the, the written word could only tell you so much. She could have talked to them. To exactly, say, did you witness anything? She could have talked to Lisa Andrews. She could have talked to Sky Hughes and Chris Hughes. She chose to spoke to exactly none of the above. So it doesn't add up. It's just... I just love how he's doing it, though. I love how he is saying, you didn't talk to this person. And he's going yeah. to each person in turn who were central in Jodie's life and saying, you didn't talk to them. And he's saying to the jury, this is what they've come up with. A, a, a case, you know, a, a defence with no witnesses. Yeah, this is the, their defence. Yeah. But they have nothing to prove it. And it's absolutely hopeless for them. They just they just don't really see it yet, but it's becoming more and more apparent every question that Martinez asks, isn't it, really? <laughs> it is, yeah. Yeah. Right. And if it's truthful, though, would it, would it cause you to reevaluate how you viewed all of these entries in the journal, if it were found that perhaps that entry was not accurate, would it cause you any problems? Is this a hypothetical? Let's assume that it's a reality and that, uh, that whatever's out there indicates that what's in that journal is not accurate. It's not, you took it to be truthful, now find out that perhaps that's not what happened. Would that cause you any problems? Sure. And it would cause you problems with regard to the, all the other entries, right? Depending on what I had collaboration sure. to defend. But if you only had the journal entries and one of them turns out to be untrue, it could then be, if you will, a cancer that is spread throughout all of these journals, right? The objection is to his characterizing this journal entry as untrue, making it as a statement rather than Overruled. You may answer the Go question. Ahead. If I'm assuming this this is untrue, right, that it would make me look much more carefully at the other journal entries and look to the other collaborative sources. And wouldn't it ca cast doubt then on whatever statements the defendant gave to you if they corroborated that, right? 
if they corroborated what's in that journal right now. I would look at all my corroborating data, Mr. Martinez. Did, did you talk to the defendant about that particular um, trip to have a suit by? Yes. And she told you that what's in there is correct, right? Correct. So if, for example, in this case, Daniel Freeman came in and testified and indicated something different than that, that would be problematic, wouldn't it? Overruled, you may answer the question. Is this hypothetical? Because I have no evidence of this. Right, you, you were not here when he testified. But no. assume hypothetically that he said something different. If you uh, uh, propose a hypothetical well, that I have no evidence of, you want me to say right. what I think about that hypothetical sure, I have sure. no evidence of? Assuming that that person came in and testified to that in this courtroom, hypothetically. All right? Yes. Under oath. All right? Yes. What if Mr. Freeman came in and testified that the fight was actually started by him? Would, I want you to assume that. Objection is characterized as Mr. Freeman's testimony. O overruled. Assume that. You know one thing I've noticed? Judge Stevens sees the path of the line of questioning that one's going with this, and she wants to hear it and she's not gonna bother with any objections Nah, she's not interested is she she's overruled both objections both similar objections saying it's mischaracterizing daniel freeman's testimony <laughs> not she, really she, she wants to know what alice answers on this because this is going to be hella relevant when it comes up further on i predict exactly because this is going to come back and bite her in the arse i reckon i i do too can I don't. Do Miss Miss Arias does not say that Mr. Tre Alexander started the fight. I, they I, just that they had a fight. I, I understand that. Assume that it was Mr. Freeman that started the fight. Correct? Can you assume that for me? I can. And assume that there was an argument because of something that Mr. Freeman did. Correct? Can you assume that for me? Okay, you're asking me to make a lot of assumptions based yes. on information I don't have. Absolutely, that's what I'm doing. Can you do that for me? I can go along with that. And assume those two facts, just those two facts. Those aren't written in that September 13, 2000 entry, is it? 2007 entry, are they? No. And if they were true, wouldn't that make that entry incomplete? No, not necessarily. I mean, it's you, you not a detailed. It's not a detailed entry. It's well, just a. Aren't you a, providing an excuse? And aren't you siding with the defendant again, saying no? It wouldn't make any difference what this other information that you gave me. No, I'm not saying that. Aren't you not looking at both sides equally when you say to me, "Well, it wouldn't matter in this case those two facts that you've added." What I'm saying is that I try to look at the, the big picture. I understand you want and, to look at the big that picture, this, And that this particular Ma'am, I want you to look at the small picture. September 13th of 2007. No. Next question. Do you know what? What? You were absolutely right. Look just at that entry. You don't want to talk about any other entry, please. All right. With regard to that entry, if you found that it was incomplete and didn't include the reason for the fight, would, wouldn't that be important to note? It doesn't include the reason for the fight. I know it doesn't, but what if, wouldn't that indicate that it's incomplete because it doesn't indicate the reason for the fight? It's just a journal entry. I, and that journal entry means nothing to you, does it? Or it does? A standalone journal entry doesn't yes. mean as much to me as when I look at the big picture. Right. I'm just talking it, about this one, and I understand what you're saying. It's it's incomplete. I will agree with that. There's not any any description of the fight or anything. So if it's incomplete with regard to that, and you're relying on it, it would appear that you're relying on something that's incomplete, correct? You're. You, I'm not sure that you're looking at how I rely on things. Well, you read it, right? Yes, I did. You 
put it into your brain, this brain that you use to go through this continuum of aggression, right? A world. Right? That I... You put that information, after reading it, assimilated it into your brain, and then made a decision based on this continuum of aggression that you talked about, right? That's what you, it's part of what you did with regard to that, right? I told you the way I used the, the continuum. So I'm not putting it into the continuum. I'm putting it into the big... All right, so you took the... Cauldron. Yeah, in keeping with the, the theme of this series, excellent use of that word. <laughs> this barrel of information that I've got. So you took this entry and you put it into this big barrel of information that you have, right? Correct. What if that's a cancerous, if you will, or invalid entry that you put in with the remain with the other information that you have there? That won't affect your view or opinion in this case? Objection. Of the world. Anything can affect. All right, specifically here in this case, we both agree, or you agree, that the reason for the fight is not there, correct? Correct. And so that's an omission on, on the writer's part, correct? To put that in there. For whatever reason, the writer didn't put it in, right? Correct. You don't know the reason why the writer didn't put it in, correct? No, I don't. It could be that it would reflect badly on the writer, right? No objection, speculation. Sustained. Well, with regard to this case, assume that Mr. Freeman came in and testified that the reason that the fight started was that the, the, because the defendant was being unreasonable as to the items that she was going to take on the trip. I want you to assume that. No objection, Mr. Freeman's testimony. I would. Assume that. Will you do that? So I'm, you, once again, you have me assuming yes. facts I, I have no knowledge Absolutely. of. Absolutely. And no evidence for. Not no evidence. You don't have any information of it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Correct? You weren't here when Mr. Freeman testified, were you? No, I was not. So assume, for purposes of looking at that journal entry, that the reason the fight started was because the defendant was being unreasonable as to the item she was going to carry on this trek. Assume that. Objection. Mischaracterizing the testimony of Mr. Freeman. Overall, this is a hypothetical. Assume that. Judge, I would ask that it be placed as a hypothetical and not that Mr. Freeman came in and said those things. Sustained. Assume the hypothetical that I just gave you, please. Okay. All right. Assuming that, wouldn't that cast doubt on the validity of that entry? Yes. And additionally, also assume. Well, I also assume, ma'am, that with regard to this fight, whatever it was, that this fight then escalated at some point and they went somewhere else, the two of them. Assume that. Can you do that? A different part of the house. Assume right. that, hypothetically speaking. All right. It doesn't talk about them going to another part of the house in that entry, does it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't talk about what happened at the other part of the house in that entry, does it? No. Wow, she's being ambushed. <laughs> she's totally being set up and she doesn't know it. I know, she's being well, taken down. Wilmot does, Wilmot knows, but, but she doesn't and, oh, it's glorious. It's glorious to watch. And it doesn't talk about what was said between the two people, if anything was said, when they were in that room, does it? And this is all hypothetical? Hypothetically. Hypothetically, hypothetically, you're, you're giving me a lot of things that I don't have any reason to believe, but I will go with a hypothetical if that's what you want. Well, does it say anything there about anything happening in a bathroom? No. Does it say anything in that entry about anybody cursing at anybody else? No, it does not. Does it say anything else about how that argument was resolved, if it was resolved at all in the bathroom? No. So, you don't have any information. That entry is an example of something that is very incomplete, right? Yes. And so, did you talk to the defendant about this? I did talk to the defendant about it, but I'm 
not recalling all the details. I'm recalling that that there was. Um, I'm recalling some of the things that the Freeman said and some of the things that Miss Arias said, but I would need to look at the Freeman's statements about this particular. I'm, I'm, that's not my question. Isn't it true that you talked to the defendant about this? That was my question. Yes. Yes, I talked to the defendant. And you t discussed this particular entry with her, right? Yes. Particular and even though you discussed this with her, and even though you had the Freeman statement in front of you, whatever that statement would, may be, you still ha found there was, n there was nothing mm -hmm. invalid about this particular entry. In other words, it's something that you found, according to your um, truth gate gatekeeping um, um, abilities, you found that one to be true, correct? I found it to be one piece of information that I... I, I, I didn't put that in the, if you're looking at it and saying, did I put that in the mix with domestic violence? No, I didn't. I'm, I, not, I'm not asking you that, if you put it into the mix with domestic violence. Are you clear about that? No, I'm, I wasn't clear about that. I'm asking because you say that you're, you take the items and you look at items that you think are truth, and then you decide to do something with them. Did you decide that this was either truthful or untruthful, given the way you approached this? I decided that it wasn't incredibly important, but did I believe it? I thought something happened and that there was an argument, and that I believe that, that Mr. Alexander apologized. Yes, I did. I, I'm not asking that question specifically. You read the entry for September 13, 2007, right? Yes, I did. And you, it's the written version, correct? Correct. I'm asking you if you believe the written version in that exhibit. Yes or no? Objection. Overruled. Did I believe? Did yes. I believe the limited information that was given there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did I believe there was an argument? No. I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you about that black item that's to your left. Do you see that? Yes, I see it's that. A but book. I'm not. Uh, Ma'am, let me do it this way. It's a journal, correct? Correct. In that journal, it's an entry for September 23, 2007, right? September 13th, 2007, Seven, right? The 13th, right? not the 23rd. Right, the 13th, correct? Yes. Do you believe that entry for September 13th, 2007, in that black book that's to your left, yes or no? Do I believe all the truth that, that it was just, do no. I believe there was an entry that said, I, I'm not sure what you're trying to get here. Delay in the inevitable, isn't she? Well, ma'am, sure. you say that you evaluate what's being told to you for the truthfulness. Didn't you just tell us that earlier today? Yes. I'm asking you to tell me, based on your statement that you evaluate things for the truthfulness of it, I'm asking you to tell me whether, after conducting this evaluation for truthfulness, you find that to be truthful or untruthful. That's all I'm asking you. Objection, Judge, can we approach? Yes, you may approach. Yeah, the entry is September 13, 2007. You've read it, correct? Correct. Do you believe everything that is written in the entry of September 13, 2007? Do I believe everything? Yes. I believe the essence of it. No, I'm not asking whether or not you believe the essence. I'm asking whether or not you believe everything that is written for the entry of September 13, 2007. Objection asked the answer. Overruled. I believe that... I, Is that yes or no, ma'am? And then you can explain. I basically... Yes, I have no reason not to All right, to thank it. you. Okay. Just want to let you guys know that, well, I am sat sitting here quietly tittering to myself. Talk about knob rushes. Indeed. Now, one of the things that you told us in taking a look at the defendant's journal was that you saw no evidence of jealousy, right? Correct. And that would assume that if you saw no evidence of jealousy, was that all of the entries would be complete and truthful, correct? Not necessarily. Well, if some entries were incomplete and untruthful, wouldn't that cast doubt on the completeness of the writings? Yes, it could. And so in this case, though, you took a look at all of the journals 
and all of the writings in the journals, and in response to a question on direct examination, you said, I saw no evidence of jealousy, correct? That wasn't just about the journals, Mr. Martinez. That was about the other evidence as well. Right. Assume that you looked at I <coughs> Fine. You looked at the, other at the other evidence too, correct? Correct. But part of what you used to look at was the journals, right? I did use the journals as well. And I want you to focus on the journals only for the purposes of my next questions, correct? Okay. And this is the journal that has this law. Uh, uh, whenever the defendant writes, she, she, um, she, de she applies this law, correct? The law of attraction. Right, the law of attraction, correct? So that she wouldn't put anything negative in there, right? She did put some negative things in the journal. I know that you indicated that she did put some negative things in the journal, but she didn't put anything about Mr. Alexander hitting her, correct? Right. Didn't put anything about Mr. Alexander choking her, correct? Correct. Didn't put anything of any physical violence from Mr. Alexander to her, correct? Correct. Didn't indicate anything about this masturbatory incident to photographs in the journal by Mr. Alexander, correct? Correct. So if you look at these journals, they're incomplete the way you view them, right? Yes. And you view them as incomplete because it's your position that she didn't want to write anything negative in there because in part of the law of attraction, right? In part. So she was censoring herself as she was writing things in there, right? Apparently. Well, no, that's what you believe though, right? I believe she censored herself. Yes. Right, and, and in censoring herself and applying the law of attraction, wouldn't it also be fair to say, if we were looking at the other side of the coin, that in terms of the question involving jealousy, that she probably was jealous, and she just didn't write it down, right? I have no evidence that she was jealous. I know you have no evidence that, of that, but because of the law of attraction, she's not going to put down something that is negative. That would be negative energy to say, I'm very jealous of Mr. Alexander with all these women. That would be a, a negative thing under the law of attraction as you know it, right? Saying that you're jealous would not necessarily be no. a negative thing. Writing it down. We're talking about the written word, right? Saying that she, saying that she was jealous would not, would not interfere with the law of attraction. Saying that maybe she wanted to handle the jealousy, that would be she could do that within those parameters. So, so being jealous, incredibly jealous, that's a good thing. Objection is characterized as your testimony. Right? I didn't say that. Well, that's my question. Isn't it true that being jealous is a negative thing with negative energy associated with it, right? Correct. I really wish I could admire it, you know, for pulling out all the stops to defend this monster, but I can't. I know I can't. To me, she's not doing her best to defend a monster. She is pulling out all the stops to make sure a murderer goes free. And that, to me, is unforgivable. Well, it's not even professional. No. I mean, let's face it, she didn't really do a thorough job. No, she was not thorough. And this is what the jury is now... Well, I think they've seen it from the start. Of course they have. I think they, you know, think they were impre you know, impressed initially with her like we were. Yeah, and then Yeah. All the all the iniquities and the anomalies they're all being laid bare now, aren't they? The cards just came tumbling down. Yeah. You see that in your business all the time, don't you? I see what? Jealousy. In yes, couples I do. that you counsel, don't you? Yes I do. It's a real negative emotion, isn't it? In the people that you counsel, right? It depends. Well, okay, so it's positive in some of the couples that you counsel. No, Jealousy. it's not a pattern in some of the couples that I counsel. I'm not asking about pattern. I'm asking about the, the emotion of jealousy. In your experience, isn't that a negative emotion? It's a human emotion. There oh, so but it's a positive emotion then. I'm asking you to put a perspective on it for me. Do you view it as, in a, and, and, as somebody who does this forensic evaluations? In domestic violence, do you view it as a positive emotion, jealousy? I view it in regard to the behavior it generates. So if it generates negative behavior, then it becomes negative. It's an emotion. An emotion in and of itself 
doesn't have to be particularly negative what? unless there is very negative behavior associated with it. Give me examples where jealousy generates positive things from it. Give me an example. There are people who get jealous, and out of that jealousy, they step back from it, they figure it out, they then approach the person in a positive way. No, you're talking about treatment. I'm not interested no, in I'm treatment. No, I'm not talking about treatment. I'm talking about what people do with jealousy. Right. I'm not asking you what people do with jealousy. I want you to tell me a situation, for example, where a woman is very jealous of a man. Tell me, in that circumstance where a woman is very jealous of the man, of all the couples that you've treated, where that some where she, that woman has done something positive so that we can hold jealousy as a virtue right up there with love. Objection Sustained. Give me an example of someone who has done who is afflicted with this incredible jealousy where they do positive things with it. You're talking about two different things. You're talking about someone who's afflicted with jealousy and someone who has become jealous. Those are very different things. <sighs> Semantics. Absolutely. It's jealousy that he is asking about and she bloody well knows it. Yeah, and she's dancing around it yet again. Let's assume that the defendant, you can't tell us that the defendant was not afflicted with jealousy, can you? I can tell you I have no evidence in collateral data that she is, and not just in her journal. Well, I'm talking about the journal. If a person, if the defendant were afflicted with jealousy, that would be a negative energy kind of thing in violation of this law that she subscribes to, yes or no? What do you mean by afflicted? What do you mean by afflicted? Isn't that the term that you used just now? No, you used the term afflicted, and I'm you didn't, feeding you didn't, it back to you. You, you didn't say a person was aff is afflicted with jealousy? I said it after you said it. You believe that I was the one that started this then? Okay. There are two types of emotions with regard to jealousy. Do you remember describing them to me just now? I said there's a difference in a pattern of jealousy, and that's basically the whole context of this of this testimony is that there is a difference between, for instance, somebody being angry and somebody having a pattern that's destructive. There's a, there's a difference between somebody feeling jealous, which human beings feel, and them acting out in a jealous way and having a pattern of jealous behavior. Let's assume a pattern of jealous behavior. That's what we're talking about. So stalking both Travis and Lisa slashing their tires sneaking into his house yeah making cookies uh pretending to be a bloody christmas tree uh, <laughs> peeking in windows when he's snogging lisa uh sending lisa nasty letters and um, intercepting his yeah and you know sending travis fake forwarded messages yeah all of this sounds like jealous behavior and yeah it's behavior that she didn't think was jealousy which does not add up no because so that is jealousy would you trust this woman at that time to sort out your domestic violence problems because no. as we've said earlier on no way i'd get me money back if i were her patients exactly can we assume that for purposes of this discussion so you're assuming no, I'm asking you to just think about this in terms of a pattern of jealous behavior. Can you do that? You're asking me to hypothetical? Yes, of course. And a hypothetical that I have no evidence of. It's a hypothetical, ma'am. Can you do that? I can sure Let's try. Let's assume that the defendant has a pattern, a hypothetical pattern of jealousy. You don't see a, hypo a pattern of jealousy in the journals, do you? No, I don't. But that lack of pattern in these journals could be because of the law of attraction because that's a negative energy kind of emotion or pattern, right? Objection, speculation. Well, this law of attraction, this energy that you've talked about, you're saying that a pattern of jealousy is a positive thing under the law of attraction? I never said that. It's a negative thing, isn't it? A pattern of jealousy yes. is a negative thing. Right, and so that goes against the law of attraction, doesn't it? where you put out positive vibes, right? Yes. 
And so if the defendant exhibited a pattern of jealousy throughout her life and didn't write about it in those journals, the reason could be because of the law of attraction that you've talked to us about, right? Right? Nobody has indicated she has a pattern of jealousy. I just indicated it to you. You've indicated it in a, in a hypothetical. Uh, I indicated it to you, and you're saying that even if it's... My point is this. This pattern of jealousy, if there is one, would not show up in those journals because she wouldn't write about it, right? Probably not. And, ma'am, with regard to this pattern of jealousy, one of the things that we can look at for the pattern of jealousy is what an individual has done, in this case, the defendant, in her other relationships, right? That's something to look at, right? Correct. Not only is it what they do, but how they handle things, right? Correct. You're aware, for example, that the defendant dated somebody by the name of Robert or Bobby Juarez, right? Correct. Okay, we're just going to take this opportunity um, just to do our last pun about Bobby Juarez and close the lid. Um, it's not fair to keep taking the Mickey out of him because we're sure, pretty sure he's not a vampire anymore. So wherever you yeah, are, we don't think he is. No, wherever you are, Bobby, we wish you well. We're we're sorry for having a little bit of fun at your expense. <laughs> um, we hope that you see the funny side of this as well and some of the stuff we've done. So if you're watching, we wish you well, mate. And that when the defendant dated Robert or Bobby Quattis, they broke up at one point. You're familiar with that, right? Correct. One of the other things that the defendant testified to was that after they broke up, she got on the telephone and called Mr. Quattis. Objection to state the entire point of that testimony. Approach, please. Just going to pause it and give a shout out and some love to those guys. Yeah. Uh, Samantha, Tanisha, Stephen and Hillary. Hillary's there. Um, she's there. She's just off camera. It's heartbreaking though. Yeah. Um, but I think that they're getting some kind of, you know, justice now yeah. seeing her unprofessionalism and her shoddy workmanship and just her incredible bias that is coming to f to the fore. I think they're getting some satisfaction out of it. Yeah, because they know that uh, one's picked up on it. Yeah. I mean, he's basically their, their warrior at the moment, if you like. Yeah, he's speaking for Travis, basically. Yeah. And as a Star Trek fan, do you know something? Juan Martinez would make a bloody good Klingon. <laughs> he he's, would. he's got that f that warrior spirit he's got that fire he's got that fire in his eyes yeah and he'd make a bloody good Klingon high counsellor a great strategist um, and a good orator um, and he doesn't need notes no he doesn't like we said complete rock star she, she and Mr. Juarez broke up you knew that right correct after they broke up the defendant was working at a restaurant. You're aware of that, right? I don't remember. If, if not, assume that that's what she testified to. Okay? okay. And she also testified that after the breakup, an older gentleman with a dog-eared Bible came into her restaurant. Assume that. Can you do that? All right. Do you know anything about it? No, I don't. And when, she came, when this individual came in, the defendant testified that this individual was prophesizing the end of the world. Do you know anything about that? No. Assume it then. And according to the defendant, because this individual came in talking about the end of the world, she decided to pick up the phone and call Bobby Juarez. Did you know anything about that? No. That's what she testified to. After she picked up the phone and and called Mr. Juarez, she identified herself. Assume that that's what she testified to. Do you know anything about it? No. He hung up on her. Assume that. In your assessment as a domestic violence person who has this schooling, 
In and of itself, if that's the first event, that's really not something that's too much of concern, is it? No, it isn't. It's just an individual, as you previously indicated, not wanting to let go, correct? Correct. Uh, sometimes when people break up, one person wants to let go and the other person usually doesn't, is the way it works out, right? Right. Let's assume that the defendant also testified that after Mr. Juarez hung up on her the first time, that she called him a second time. Now it's beginning to get a little bit dicier because she won't go away, right? It's not atypical. It's not unusual. It may not be atypical, but it's not the first telephone call. It's the second one. It's now becoming, if we're going to start using the word pattern, it's now starting to become a bit of a pattern, right? Because it happened, hasn't happened once, it's happening again, right? It's the start of a pattern, right? It could be. It's possible. All right. But it's also typical. He's not lying. He, she did testify to this. She did, yeah. For people to make yeah. more than one. Whether call. it's typical or not, I'm asking whether or not it could be the start of a pattern. That's what I'm asking. Could, could be. And during this second telephone call, assume that the defendant testified that during this second telephone call, she again was able to get a hold of Mr. Juarez. And after Mr. Juarez knew who it was, he again hung up on her. Assume that. In that relationship, assume that they get together. And after they get together, they break up again. And after they break up, Mr. Juarez is staying at his place of residence. Assume that, that the defendant testified to that. Do you know anything about that? No. Assume that the defendant then said, or that indicated that even though they were broken up, she was still attempting to contact Mr. Juarez. Assume that. She testified to that. All right. Overruled. The jury is directed to recall the testimony previously provided in this trial. You may continue. And she was doing things in this attempt to contact him. According to her, she was buying things like groceries and leaving them at his doorstep. Are you aware of anything like that? No. Assume that that's part of the facts in this case. You previously testified that people who are starting to have this pattern, that's one of the things that they do. They look for excuses to keep contact with the person that has left them, right? Different situation at the end of a relationship. People oftentimes don't let go right away. But I, I, I'd want to see how far it went and, and I'm, I'm what I'm telling you tell how me. far it went. That's right. what the defendant testified to. All right. That she left things like groceries at his doorstep All right. for whatever reason. So again, even though the relationship is over, that indicates that there's still on the part of the defendant, some action to keep contact, doesn't it? Yes. And again, if we take into account the two calls that were involved, and now this contact, it does seem that there's the beginning of a pattern where the defendant is doing something in a, in, in a positive fashion to keep the relationship going when the other party is, is done, right? Timeline as to as to over what time of period this is actually occurring. Sustained. Let's say it happened within a year. All right. Will you assume that? That that there's a year no, of let constant me, let me contact. Let me um, assume sure. that there's a breakup. There's the calls. They get back together. They break up again, and then there's this contact, leaving things at the door, and that all that happens. Let's say between six to eight months apart. This whole thing. Assume right. that. Okay. And then assume that the defendant told us that they break up again and that the individual, Bobby Juarez, moved to Medford. Do you know anything about that? I don't know about Bobby Juarez. I don't know much about Bobby Juarez. So why the hell is she testifying for? And why did Wilmot and Nermi not prepare her? Yeah, I mean, you would think that she... You know, the, the, they would have gone over the Bobby Juarez stuff with her. 
considering how heavily it was covered during Jody's testimony. Exactly. They may have, you know, they, they should have actually been more thorough and said, well, you know, review the Bobby Juarez stuff. Usually, uh, lawyers prepare the witnesses. Yeah. But this... She hasn't been prepared. No. She wasn't prepared. And she didn't go as far back as she should have done because, I mean, I don't even think Wilmot and Nermi expected, you know, Martinez to be this thorough, to go back to what Bobby, you know, Bobby Juarez even, to yeah. go back to her teenage years. But he deals. He's left very, if he's left any stones unturned, there's very, very few, isn't there? Oh, yeah. We'll assume that he moved to a place called Medford, Oregon. And okay. that was the testimony, correct? And after, and he started to live with an individual by the name of Matthew McCartney. Do you know anything about that? I do know about that. Assume that after Mr. Juarez moved to um, Medford, Oregon, that the defendant, even though they'd broken up and she's, and, and she's living somewhere else, <laughs> she began... to her testimony with regard to the breakup at that point. Overruled again, the jury is directed to recall the testimony. You may continue. After the breakup, and Mr. Juarez is in Medford, Oregon, living with Matthew McCartney, she testified that she then started going there on weekends. Assume that. Doesn't that begin to show a pattern of, number one, telephone calls, then contact at the door, and then after the individual, and they're broken up, moves away, She's still starting, keep it, trying to keep contact. Doesn't that, and this is over a period of many months, isn't that the beginnings of a pattern? Objection, Judge. Mischaracterizing Ms. Arias' testimony as to when the breakup occurred, they were not broken up at that point when she was traveling. So the hypothetical is not true. Approach, please. Sustained. Make and assume that they were broken up when Mr. Juarez moved to Medford. Assume that, okay? Will you do that as part of the hypothetical? Isn't that a pattern developing here on the part of the defendant? A jealous sort of pattern where Mr. Juarez and her are broken up, she's making telephone calls, and after making telephone calls, she then starts bringing him stuff over to his house, and then after he moves away, she goes to the area where he has moved to. Assume that. Wouldn't that be the beginning of a pattern? But they're, they're not broken up. No, I just said they were. But that's the hypothetical. Yes. The hypothetical, because in reality they're not. Correct? You believe that they're not, but let's assume okay. the hypothetic, the hypothetically speaking they are broken up. Would that be the beginning of a pattern? Yes. It could be the beginning of a pattern. Let's talk about Matthew McCartney. You're familiar with the relationship involving the defendant and Mr. McCartney, correct? Correct. And in fact, uh, the defendant sort of went from Mr. Um, Juarez and started dating Mr. McCartney, right? Correct. And there came a point when they started dating that for whatever reason, there was going to be a breakup, right? Correct. And it was the defendant who refused to accept the breakup, correct? She had a hard time with the breakup. In other words, he wanted to break up and she did not, right? Correct. And when they were going through this process, he believed that they were already broken up, right? When? Objection, Dave. He, at the some state. point, they broke up at some point, didn't they? Yes. And after they broke up, the defendant then confronted somebody by the name of Bianca, correct? Correct. Objection. Testimony after the breakup. Over. Yes, it's and I that, don't think it was a confrontation. I didn't say uh, it, the confrontation, but it's after the breakup that Miss Arias, according to you, goes and talks to Bianca, right? Objection is characterizing the testimony. I'm not talking about testimony. I'm talking about her understanding. Overruled. Right. I'm not sure if they were broken up or not. I I only know that that she went and talk to Bianca. She talked to Bianca about the breakup. God, how many examples are we seeing of her lack of 
preparation, her lack of research, her lack of work on this case. Yeah, she's not done a fuller investigation, no. otherwise she would have had that information. She has done a half, she's not even done a half job of it. She's not even gone, you know, nearly as deep as she needed to in order to fully determine who she was, you know, going to represent and who she was going to defend and help defend. Yeah, but I don't think they actually properly <sighs> prepared, prepared her for it. No. I mean, you would think that, you know, the time she spent with Martinez <laughs> would have kind of opened her eyes a little bit as to, you know, the what... The kind of prosecutor he is. Yeah, not just that, but what her client is capable of. Exactly. And it just boggles the mind that she's still, even to this day, but certainly back here in this period, is steadfast, loyal and true to her client. And I just don't get it, do you? It no, just doesn't make sense. It's not logical. Yeah, I guess it was a breakup. She, she went to talk about, she said it was cheating. And she went to talk to Bianca about the cheating. Do you remember writing about this? Uh, in your notes. I'm sure that I did. And isn't it true that your notes indicate that... Something that's not marked. Oh, world. Isn't it true that your notes indicate that they had already broken up when this talk between Matt, between uh, the, the defendant and Bianca took place? I need to see my notes. Okay. Are you asking me to just look at the highlighted section or do you want me to read the entire thing? What's that? Do you want me to just read the highlighted section or the entire thing? Uh, I want you to focus on the highlighted section and then if you want, read the whole thing. All right. And isn't it true that there was this breakup, correct, between her and Mr. McCartney, correct? Yes, yes. or no? And isn't it true that it was after this breakup that there was this conversation between the defendant and Bianca, correct? Correct. Isn't that part of a pattern of jealous behavior in confronting somebody? It didn't sound like a confrontation either by uh, Mr. McCartney or Miss Arias. It sounded like she went and had a talk with her, maybe clarified, I don't know. Uh, Ms. Ms. But, but I didn't get the jealous behavior. I got the, the going to talk to someone. It wasn't, if it was real jealous, it seems like it would have been more confrontational. So um, it's not described that way. Mr. McCartney wasn't present for that one, was he? No, but he said it wasn't. Right. And it was based on what the defendant told him, right? I would told suspect he talked to Bianca as well. Pardon? I would suspect he talked to his own girlfriend about it. Again, now you're assuming, because it's to the benefit of the defendant, that Mr. McCartney spoke to Bianca. You don't know that, do you? I know that Mr. McCartney said that it wasn't uh, right. an adversarial situation. Right, and the, the issue with that is he wasn't present, correct? No, he wasn't. Any information he would have received would have come either from the defendant or perhaps from Bianca, if he spoke with Bianca, correct? Correct. So anything that he knows, he knows secondhand, correct? Correct. Very clever. I see what he's doing. He is saying that, you know, Matt got this information second hand. Okay. You think about it, whatever happened, Alice is getting it third hand. Exactly. So why is she putting any stock in it? It's, it's brilliant, this is. It's such good strategy from him. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, but it looks like she's being worn down at the moment yeah but she's it's not just her being worn down what she has said in this trial he is completely undermining it now you know what we said about the house of cards he's, he's going for the foundations oh, of course he is he wants to pull it out of the ground yeah and the building is starting to buckle yeah and after this confrontation isn't it true that the defendant went at some point shortly after that, and slept in Mr. McCartney's bed without his permission. Yes. Again, isn't that, given in light of what happened with Mr. Quise, and in light of what's happening here with uh, Mr. McCartney, 
Doesn't that suggest to you a pattern of jealousy? It, pers it, it suggests a pattern of having a very difficult time letting go. What the bloody hell is the difference? That is jealousy. Why does she categorise it for some people yet put a completely different spin on it for a client? Because she's protecting her. Jeez, talk about cherry picking at its finest. But she's not controlling anyone with her jealousy. She's not controlling them. Take a look at uh, this exhibit, 614. you recognize it? Yes, yeah, the continuum. And it's the same one that we talked about before, right? Yes. The only difference is that this one is clearer, correct? Clearer? In other words, the letters are clearer. It's there aren't any exacerbating factors on it. There's so no what? There's no exacerbating factors on right. it. Other than that, the, and that's the other change, but other than that, it's just a clear presentation of the uh, items uh, in the up and down fashion, right? Judge, she had the original exhibit to compare. Yes. Judge, I don't want her to compare the original. I'm just saying, isn't this something that she present that that she's familiar with? Well, All right, I've rolled. Is this something you're familiar with and you put together, correct? Yes, it's incomplete. And <coughs> that's fine. It's incomplete, but this is something you put together, correct? Yes. All right. I move for the admission of Exhibit 614. Judge, may we approach? 614 is admitted. talking about the defendant, that that was not necessarily a pattern of jealousy, correct? Correct. Right. Actually, what we're really talking about is that that's a pattern of stalking, isn't it? No, it isn't. Oh, yes, it is. Well, she's gone and contacted Bobby Juarez on the telephone two times after the breakup, right? She has. And she's left things at his door after they've broken up, correct? Stalking implies fear. Yes or no? Stalking implies yes fear. Yes or no? Incorrect. Yes. Stalking is about fear. Yes, what's the objection? The objection is she clearly cannot answer the question with a yes or no answer. All right. Overruled. Restate your question. Isn't it true <laughs> that she, with regard to Mr. Juarez, she left things in, uh, at his doorstep, correct? Yes. I'm, and isn't it true that with regard to Mr. McCartney, one of the things that she did is that she went and spoke to the person that she believed that he was seeing, correct? Correct. And then she slept in his bed, right? She did. And with regard to Mr. Alexander, isn't it true that one of the things that you know with regard to the Reagan Housling uh, um, instant messaging was that Mr. Alexander was exceedingly afraid because of the defendant's stalking behavior. Overruled. Me? I don't know that he's exceedingly afraid. I don't get. Judge, may I then ask her the, what well, I think we'll need to approach. Him. Yes, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take the evening recess. During the break, did you have an opportunity to look at your schedules for the dates I indicated earlier? Let's start with this Friday, April 12, from 9.30 to 12.30. Is there anyone who could not be here from 9.30 to 12.30 this Friday? All right, thank you. Please plan to be here. For April 26, from 9 to 4, is there anyone who could not be here? 
Thank you, please plan to be here. Now May 3rd, it appears we may not need that date, but is there anyone who has a problem with that date? <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, please keep that on your calendar as well. <clears throat> All right, please remember the admonition. Have a nice evening tomorrow morning, 9.30. Have a nice evening. Wow. Talk about an eventful day of testimony. Yeah, that was very eventful. Yeah. I mean, he picked apart. I don't think he's done yet. I don't know how long he's got to question her, but I'm sure he's savouring every moment and he's drawing it out as long as he can. Yeah, and he's bringing out little things every single time. Yeah. Picking one, an, another one of the lies. Yeah. And holes are just appearing everywhere. Her her testimony now looks like Swiss cheese. Yeah, with a load of holes. Yeah. Um, it has been very gratifying to see, hasn't it? It has, yeah. It's been great to see a took down on this peg or two. Yeah, but not just that, the way it's done. It's just done so skillfully and just so methodically. And I tell you what, it's for a guy with no notes, it's almost surgical. It's it's wow. Yeah. <laughs> it Fireworks. really works. It really has blown us away today, but um part forty eight, hopefully if we can do it next week next saturday if not we'll let you know but you know we'll see a bit more from him but yeah, we maybe. we really enjoyed that day didn't we yeah we did yeah it was uh it Fireworks. was a, it was fascinating to watch brilliant absolutely brilliant. we hope you guys enjoyed watching it with us um we hope you enjoyed and and you know we got something out of our comments on this um Thank you so much for staying with us if you're still here. I mean, this is what this is well over four hours, isn't it? This video, yeah, it's a long one, this a time. long one. This one, so thanks for staying with us. Um, and thank you to all our new subscribers. We finally got over 6,000 subscribers. Thank you so much, yeah, everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, here's to the next, next thousand. <laughs> um, but every one of you that subscribed to us, we really appreciate it. We're grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all the comments. Keep them coming. Um, we're trying to engage with you as much as we can. Uh, thank you for all the likes. Thank you so, so much to our Macclesfield mob for keeping the faith, staying with us and believing in us. We love you so much, guys. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. We're going to do maybe a live stream exclusively for you guys. So uh, please do stay tuned for that, yeah? Yeah, and keep a lookout. Yeah, keep a lookout for that. We're, we're planning on doing a live stream just for you guys. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, please leave us a comment. Please like. Please subscribe. Um, and we shall see you hopefully very soon for part 48, yeah? Yeah, we'll see you soon. Okay, take care. Look after yourselves. And one, one love, love from, from Macclesfield. Macclesfield. Bye. Bye.